we get started here, there's something I have to explain. This review has been in the works ever since summer of last year. One of the reasons my video output was so low in late 2020 is that I was working on this. I managed to get all of the audio recorded and edited when I ran into a big problem. I couldn't really do much for the visuals. Sure, I could get panels from the comic, but not only would some of the stuff be hard to recreate, but it wouldn't be that interesting to look at either. I would have to get really creative to make the visuals engaging for a video like this. It would take a lot of effort, and there's no way I was doing that for a three hour long video. So I decided to make this an audio only review. I know that sounds disappointing, but I don't think the visuals would have added much here. Besides, I think when it comes to videos this long, most people tend to play them in the background while they do something else. So you can almost treat this video like a podcast. Relax, this audio only thing isn't going to become the norm for me. It's just for this very specific situation. Now sit back, relax, and listen to my thoughts on the most loved and hated comic on the internet. As far as web comics go, there are a few names as well known as Homestuck. If you spend enough time on the internet, you've probably heard about it. What you've heard can vary greatly depending on who's talking about it. This comic has a complicated legacy to say the least. Some think it's amazing, others think it's terrible, and some think it's just okay once you peel away all the gimmicks. It has a truly unique format that no other comic has successfully copied, and a beyond intimidating 8,000 plus page count. It launched Toby Fox's career, giving us Undertale, and also created one of the most infamously toxic fandoms on the internet. You might think this is a weird time to be talking about Homestuck, as it ended back in 2016, so it's been dead in the water for a while, right? Actually, that couldn't be farther from the truth. The past few years have given us everything from spin-off games, to an epilogue, to a full-on sequel comic. All of this new content, coupled with some of its questionable levels of quality to say the least, leads me to ask one question. Was Homestuck actually any good? I read the whole thing in 2016, a couple months after it ended to be exact, and I loved it. However, looking back on a lot of the elements makes me wonder if it'll hold up as well when I'm not looking at it through rose-colored glasses. So, I went back and reread the whole comic, and now I'm going to review it. As you probably guessed by the video's length, this isn't going to be some quick overview. I'm going through the entire comic. I could explain more about the way this review is going to be structured, but I think it'll be best to just jump right into it. Let's start with Act 1. Just a warning up front, I'm going to get sidetracked a lot in this segment, but I kind of have to since there's so much general stuff about the comic that I need to go over. Act 1 begins with a page so iconic, it's been burned into the memories of most Homestuck fans. A young man sits alone in his room. It just so happens that, wait, 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 this isn't right. Who the hell is this guy? Where are the trolls? That's what you're thinking, right? I mean, that's what most people would be thinking in this situation. The trolls are by far the most well-known and iconic part of the whole comic. So it might shock you to learn that they don't show up until Act 4 and aren't formally introduced until Act 5. They do play a major role in the story, but despite what you might expect, they're not the focus. Anyway, back to Act 1. The first page tells you a good deal about the comic right out of the gate. For starters, there's only one panel, and it's accompanied by narration, which is true of most pages in this comic, particularly in the early acts. Second, the picture actually moves. It's a gif, and a pretty clever one, too, because it stays still just long enough to trick you into thinking it's a regular image. And this is the biggest thing that sets Homestuck apart from other comics. It doesn't just use still images. It incorporates gifs, music, full animations, and even games into the comic structure. In turn, it creates something really unique that can only really work online. There are actually physical books of the comic, but I really don't recommend picking them up. Sure, they do have some behind-the-scenes commentary, but so much of the magic is lost when you're reading on a static piece of paper instead of a much more active web page. Also, buying all of them will cost you around $150 and won't even get you halfway through the comic, while reading online is absolutely free. Anyway, the last element to take note of on this page is the way to progress. It's not a simple next page button. Instead, it's a command that impacts the next page. This creates a really unique feeling of the reader interacting with the comic like it was a video game. And a lot of this is because these commands were from the readers. People would submit command requests and HUD
Plus, he would choose one and respond accordingly. The way things are structured almost creates a conflict between the reader and the story. The command suggestions got discontinued midway through Acts 3, because by that point, they were impossible to keep up with. The command stuck around afterward, but had a slightly different feel to them. They focused more on advancing the story, while these first three acts, by Hussey's own admission, can be a bit meandering. He's even said they're like a prologue that you could skip if you want to, and it's actually a common thing in the fandom for people to skip to when the trolls show up. Should you do this? Well, it's really up to hell no! The first three acts of Homestuck are a lot like book one of Avatar. Yeah, they're not as grand or exciting as the comic will go on to be, but they set up a lot, and by skipping them, not only are you going to be lost, but you're going to miss out on a lot of good stuff. I'll be the first to admit, I kinda made this mistake on my first read through. I didn't skip the earlier acts, but I kinda viewed them as an obstacle. I wanted to see the gang enter the game, and I wanted to see the trolls, and these acts were in the way of that. On my second read, though, I had a much greater appreciation for these first three acts. Speaking of which, we should probably get back to Act 1. A couple pages later, we get a formal introduction of our main character. John Egbert. Whenever a new character gets introduced, I'm gonna go over my thoughts on them. So, what is there to say about John? He's a bit naive and dorky, and has a love for old school pranks and bad movies. Not in a so bad it's good way, he actually enjoys them and talks about them quite a bit. Overall, he's a really charming and likable character. Speaking of John's movies, another unique thing about Homestuck is the way it handles pop culture references. Whenever most works of fiction reference pop culture, they stick to things that are well known and usually current, so the audience can easily relate to the reference. Not Homestuck, though. While it occasionally references something popular, most of the big references are to smaller, more obscure properties, which I think adds to the charm. The most frequently referenced piece of pop culture here is John's favorite movie. He talks about it a ton, his friends get him gifts based on it, and he'll even reenact scenes from the movie whenever he gets the chance. Can you guess what it is? That's right, the 1997 Nicolas Cage movie, Con Air. If you managed to guess that, Congratulations! You cheated! So, what exactly is this comic about? I got so sidetracked with introductions that I kind of forgot to explain that part. Basically, it's about John and his friends playing a new video game, and things get crazy pretty fast. The first half of Act 1 is John trying to get his hands on the game, and I'll fully admit, things do feel a bit slow until that happens. Most of the time here is spent on jokes. They come from a lot of places. The goofiness of the command structure, the weirdness of John's house, and of course, the Silidex. You see, despite the fact that John isn't playing the game yet, there are still video game mechanics. The Silidex serves as a sort of inventory system. Each character's Silidex works differently, and a lot of jokes revolve around them. They get forgotten in later acts, but for the first few, they have a pretty major presence. I should say this right now. Homestuck has a very strange, surreal, and goofy style of humor. It's hard to describe, but you pick up on it pretty quick. And honestly, it's the biggest make-or-break factor of the comic. While there is some good drama here, Homestuck ultimately revolves around its comedy. So if you don't like its sense of humor, you aren't going to like the comic. And the first half of Act 1 serves as a good litmus test for that. If you feel a bit antsy waiting for things to start happening, that's perfectly fine. I felt the same way both times I read it. However, if you outright dislike like the humor or think it's cringe, then Homestuck isn't for you and you should probably stop reading. You really do have to experience the humor yourself though, my descriptions really can't do it justice. Now, I bet you're wondering about dialogue. Are these all silent characters who you only learn about through the narration? Nope, dialogue just happens differently here. Instead of regular speech bubbles, you get chat logs at the bottom of the page. This is because instead of talking to people directly, John's talking with his friends through the chat client Pester Chub. Yeah, this this comic started in 2009, and you get plenty of reminders of that when you read. Luckily, most of the stuff doesn't feel outdated. It feels more like a time capsule of the era. But enough about 2009. How's the dialogue itself? It's really good. Like, on my second read, I was surprised by how good it was. It's fun and engaging, it gives you a good idea of what the characters are like. In Act 1, we hear a lot from two of John's friends, and get some foreshadowing about the third. Anyway, after a bunch of shenanigans, John gets to his mailbox to get the game, and we're greeted with a flash. Basically, whenever you see a bracketed S in one of the commands, it means the next page has sound, which usually means a flash is coming. While flashes can take many forms, they're usually an animation too complex for a gif accompanied by some music. 
While the animations are rarely professional quality, they often work through those limitations to create something that looks somewhat cinematic and manages to tell the story really well. The first one's pretty simple, but it nicely takes you to the title and signals that you're in for something special. And yes, that music does give me some nice nostalgic feelings. Just a couple pages later, and we get the first of a different kind of flash, an interactive one. As you probably guessed, these are used much more sparingly than the regular animations, but like a lot of things in this comic, they get more complex as they go. This one's pretty simple, having you enact a goofy RPG-style battle with John's father. That's right, I should probably talk about him next. Dad Egbert, yes, that's seriously the name we're given, is a man of few words. As in, he never gets any dialogue, and that's actually true of all the kids' guardians we meet. Despite the lack of dialogue, he clearly has a lot of personality, just judging from what John says about him, his home decorations, and his appearances on screen. That's about all I'm gonna say though. Look, Homestuck has a lot of characters, so for the sake of time, I'm only going to do these bios for the more major characters, mainly those with speaking roles. Anyway, John gets back to his room, and after some more funny Silidex shenanigans, he installs Suburb. Oh yeah, Suburb is the name of the game this comic's about, and yes, it is confusing as hell to pronounce. So, how does one play Suburb? Well, if I were to explain all of it now, it would be the biggest detour yet, so how about I don't? Besides, Part of the fun of this comic is finding out more and more about the game. Granted, that kind of bites the story in the ass later, but we'll get to that when we get to that. For right now, it functions like The Sims of all things. One of John's friends gets on their computer and can place items in John's house, move things around, and even build new areas. Oh, and this is treated like it's perfectly normal by the characters, which weirdly makes the comedy work better. I don't think all the game-related shenanigans that follow would be nearly as funny if the characters were constantly questioning how they were possible. The rest of the chapter essentially consists of John and Rose trying to figure out the rules of the game, while Rose accidentally makes a mess in John's house, which leads to some really funny back and forths. Oh yeah, the second kid gets formally introduced, but it's so close to the end that it'd make more sense to go over her in Act 2. Anyway, we find out there's a meteor heading straight for John's house, and he manages to create an apple tree using some machines from the game. Immediately afterward, we get the most intense flash yet. It shows John holding an apple and a meteor careening straight toward his house while some suspenseful music plays. We don't see the impact, but we do see a mushroom cloud and the deserted remains years later. And then the act ends. Act 2 picks up right after that insane cliffhanger. We get a glimpse of the post-apocalyptic world and Rose's GameFAQs article. Yeah, remember when GameFAQs was frequently used? Again, references like this feel more charming than dated, at least to me. Then we see John's house. It teleported into the game world right before the meteor hit. We're then greeted by the first casualty of the restructuring. Let me explain. Homestuck was originally on MSPainAdventures.com, but was moved to the new website, Homestuck.com. The reason for this move is actually pretty simple. Most of the flashes originally used Adobe Flash Player, you know, the program that just got discontinued. As a result, a lot of the flashes have been changed to accommodate this. I didn't bring it up before because everything's been intact so far, but here's where the changes start. This was originally a point-and-click-esque game where you could move John around his house and examine various items. They've retained all the text and they let you play the music that was originally part of the game, but it just isn't the same. Now, I don't want to bash the web website programmers too much, as I don't claim to know how this stuff works, but I do know that HTML5 is a format they could probably transfer this over to. While I understand it might have been necessary, losing the interactive element was a massive blow to the story. You still functionally get all the information, but it's a lot less immersive. Anyway, John gets a few more commands, but these aren't like the earlier ones. They're written like someone's ordering him around, and it turns out someone actually is. That'll be important later, but for right now, let's get back to Rose. The reason I waited until now to introduce Rose is that the comic kinda does too. Act 1 gives her the formal introduction spiel it gave to John, but that's about it. Act 2 is when you really get to know her. Rose Lalonde is actually my favorite character in the early acts. She's a smug, sarcastic know-it-all who does things like try to psychoanalyze your friends and engage in needlessly complicated, passive-aggressive warfare with her mother. I won't spoil it, but let's just say there's a hilarious 
seriously intricate joke involving a fridge. Now, all of this makes Rose sound seriously unlikable, but it's all handled in a way where it's clearly just friends messing around with each other. Also, while all the base sprites have really good facial expressions, for some reason I find Rose is the funniest. While we're doing introductions, Kid 3 gets introduced pretty early in the act. Dave Strider is a character I remembered being pretty annoying, but upon rereading, that wasn't the case at all. He's both an amateur rapper and a big time hipster who's constantly doing things ironically. And yes, we never see him take those sunglasses off. Ever. He also writes a purposely bad webcomic called Sweet Bro and Hella Jeff, which actually exists and was made alongside Homestuck. And I gotta say, it's kind of ahead of its time. Like, you know how surreal memes have gotten within the past decade? Well, this is probably what they'll look like in another decade. I don't think any of us are on a level where we can properly process Sweet Bro and Hella Jeff. It's mostly separate from Homestuck, but every now and then, a reference will be slipped in right when you least expect it. While Rose and Dave are getting more fleshed out in this act, so is kid number four. She only had a couple of short conversations before, but now we're hearing from her about as much as we did from Rose and Dave in act one. Now that introductions are out of the way, what actually happens in this act? Well, it's split into three plot lines, and they're all paced similarly to act one after John and Rose started playing Suburb. Meaning they stay on track and keep things moving, but aren't above pausing the action for a joke or two. John's plot line has him navigate his house while killing the enemies that have spawned inside and learning more about the game. The odd thing here is that some of these Strife segments work as originally intended and some don't, so I'm even more confused now about what they're doing with the flashes. Anyway, this plotline gives us a lot of crazy imagery and surreal jokes, which is a lot of fun. The mysterious figure keeps giving John commands, which he clearly notices, but isn't happy about one bit. Also, John meets his Nana, who merged with one of the game mechanics, it's a long story, and we get her telling him about his destiny in the game, which is is honestly kind of sweet. Next, we have Rose's plotline. Simply put, the power's gone off, so Rose sneaks around her weirdly large house in search of a place to plug in her computer so she can help John. This plotline is easily my favorite of the three, if for no other reason than the hilarious rivalry Rose has with her mom, which even results in a strife segment. Finally, there's Dave's plotline. Through a series of hilariously stupid events, his copy of Suburb gets destroyed, so he needs to use his bro's copy instead. Now, that sounds kind Dull, but here's the thing. Dave's bro is freaking insane. Like, John's dad and Rose's mom were eccentric, but Dave's bro leaves all these weird puppets lying around, fills the fridge with weapons, and purposely sets traps for Dave to try and freak him out. It feels like the whole act, he's battling a mysterious, malevolent force known only as bro. Oh, and there's Lil' Cow. Bro's main puppet, who's ever so slightly disturbing, and appears in the strangest places imaginable. Seriously, this puppet goes on one hell of a journey throughout the comic. Also, I should mention that some of Dave's plotline takes place earlier in the comic, so you see the other side of conversations he's had with other characters, which might get a little confusing, but trust me, it gets even more confusing as we go along. Anyway, Bro's antics finally reach a boiling point when he challenges Dave to a sword fight on the roof, and right as the action's about to start, we get a preview of Kid Number 4. But that's also a fake out, and instead, we get introduced to the Wayward Vagabond, the mysterious figure who's been sending commands to John. Yeah, I was kinda pissed at this fake out on my first read, and honestly still think it's kind of annoying, but the interlude itself is actually pretty good. At first, it seems like a trolling attempt designed to do nothing other than waste your time, but the Wayward Vagabond is a pretty charming character who drops subtle hints about what's going on. Also, he doesn't have any dialogue, so it's all commands with this guy. In his time in this strange basement, he creates Cantown and declares himself mayor, befriends a firefly, foreshadows future events, and uses the appear of fire, which becomes very important later on. Then, once again, we end this chapter with a flash. But this one's a bit more complex. It shows us a couple of events in the beginning that we don't have the context to understand yet, and then moves on to showing where the other plot lines are. Each one at a nice, suspenseful, cliffhanger moment. By the way, now's as good of a time as any to talk about how they changed the video flashes. They used to be built into the website, but now most of them are YouTube videos. Now, I'm fine with this for the most part. After all, if you hit play and don't go full screen, it's like experiencing them in their original form. There are a few that can't be properly recaptured by a YouTube video, but we'll get to that when we get to that. My only issue with going the YouTube route is the fact that the flashes are only in 360p. Come on, 
Really? Now, I'm not claiming to know everything that went down behind the scenes. What I do know is that there are fan uploads of the Flashes that have higher resolutions. So they literally could have downloaded and re-uploaded those videos and have gotten a better result. Again, this isn't a problem if you don't hit full screen, but you know, people are going to do that because it's an option. Anyway, yeah, that's act two. So remember how act two teased the reveal of kid number four before showing us the wayward vagabond instead? Well, don't worry, act three starts by introducing her, so it's not like you have to wait very long. Jade Harley is probably the strangest of the main four, which makes sense since she grew up on an island with no one but her dog to keep her company for most of her life. Despite all the isolation, She's surprisingly sweet, well-adjusted, and outgoing. She's pretty eccentric, though, keeping strings wrapped around her fingers to remind her of things, and constantly seeing visions of the future in her dreams. Actually, it's not just visions of the future. She enters a whole dream world whenever she goes to sleep, and what do you know? That dream world is part of Suburb. Her movements in the dream world are also connected to a robot she has in the real world. Why does she have this? I'm not sure, but it leads to some pretty hilarious antics. She's also a low-key furry, which doesn't doesn't sound too crazy, but keep in mind, this is 2009, back when furries were seen as the scourge of the internet instead of relatively normal. I'm not acting like Hussy was some groundbreaking advocate for furry rights or anything, especially since it's a really small part of her character, but this was ahead of its time. Now that I've introduced all four kids, there's something I've really got to give the writing credit for. As you probably noticed, John, Rose, Dave, and Jade are all really different and don't seem like the kind of people that would hang out together. Despite their differences, though, you never once doubt that these four are close friends. Their friendship is written that well. It's to the point where this act has a flashback of them sending each other birthday presents, which is really sweet. Anyway, Act 3 plays out very similarly to Act 2, only now we have a couple more plot lines going on. Let's start with Jade, since I was just talking about her. Jade's plot line involves her leaving her house to go to the temple outside in order to pick up a copy of Suburb. Once again, this is a lot more interesting interesting than it sounds, mainly because Jade's living situation is even weirder than she is. Aside from her dog with godlike teleportation powers, Jade's house is full of so many weird items, even when compared to the other kids' houses. A lot of it is super futuristic technology, which is really interesting to see in action, but some of it is just strange miscellaneous items, like this thing, or the magic cue ball, which is the perfect segue into my next point. You see, the magic cue ball really only shows up for one page here, but it's it's so important later on that it's directly linked to one of the main villains of Act 5. I'm not saying this to stress the cue ball specifically, it's just a really good example. There are so many little things throughout the comic, mostly in the first half, that seem incredibly minor but manage to tie into the story in a big way later down the road. It creates the illusion that Hussey had this grand master plan for Homestuck and that it's one of the most intricately constructed narratives out there. From what I understand though, that is the case. While Hussey clearly had some things planned out, he was largely making things up as he went along. He's just so good at making callbacks that he was able to turn incredibly minor elements into future plot points and create the illusion that it was all planned from the start, which is arguably just as impressive. This has been going on for a while, but I felt the cue ball was the best example of it. I really like seeing all these seemingly minor elements come together in complex and unexpected ways, almost like storytelling with a Rube Goldberg machine. Making up the story as you go sounds like a recipe for disaster, and eventually I feel like it comes back to bite the comic in the ass, but that doesn't happen for a surprisingly long time. So what about the other plot lines in this chapter? Well, for starters, we get introduced to a few other new characters. There's the man who imprisoned John's father, Jack Noir. He's really the first instance we have of a villain in Homestuck. He doesn't really do much here, aside from try and fail to stop John's dad from escaping and refusing to wear silly hats, but he becomes a much bigger deal later on. We also get two more characters in the same desert area as the Wayward Vagabond. These two are the Peregrine Mendicant and the Aimless Renegade. These two are fine, but not nearly as charming as the Wayward Vagabond. There isn't really much that happens with them in this chapter. They meet up, and the Aimless Renegade attacks them. This plotline isn't boring, though. It actually ties into what Jade does in her plotline, leaving you with a bunch of different things to keep track of. In fact, a lot of the stuff involving Jade's plotline 
plotline has you doing that. Especially when you're once again looking at the other sides of conversations you've already seen. So what about the other kids? What are they doing? Well, after an incredibly one-sided strife segment against his bro, Dave gets the copies of Suburb and helps Rose enter the game before her house gets destroyed. He doesn't really get much screen time here, which is understandable because there are a lot of plot lines going on and not that much time, so the cuts had to happen somewhere. Rose has been sent into a mysterious underground laboratory by her mom, where she finds a computer that shows the whole world is being bombarded by meteors, and more importantly, she finds a power source for her computer so she can help John out. Finally, John's plotline is really simple on paper. He fights a bunch of enemies on the roof of his house and gains a bunch of upgrades as a reward. That doesn't sound like much, but he also encounters multiple big reveals that result in some pretty funny mental breakdown scenes. Plus, we get our first alchemization segment. You see, one of the main mechanics of Suburb allows the kids to spawn copies of any item they can fit in their Silidex. What's really cool about this is that they can combine items to make new ones. Each of the main four gets their own segment where they alchemize a bunch of brand new items and they're always a lot of fun. Taking whatever random items are lying around a character's inventory and mixing them around to see what kind of creative combinations you get is so interesting to watch, even if some of the creations haven't exactly aged well. These segments always last the perfect amount of time, long enough for you to get your alchemization fix, but short enough to not overstay their welcome. The only other thing I need to talk about with this act is the ending. Just like the others, it ends with a flash. This one primarily shows Rose entering the game while showing off glimpses of the other characters' plot lines. I especially like the fact that Dave's drawing a sweet bro in Hella Jeff comic while he helps Rose. This flash has some great music, and while visually it's not quite on the level of some of the best flashes in the comic, you can tell it's getting there. So those are the first three acts. Sure, they might not be as focused or serious as what comes after, but they were still a lot of fun. But now that they're over, you know what that means. We get to see Act 4, with the trolls, the more intense tone, and the more focused storytelling, right? Well... Yeah. Right as you think you're getting to Act 4, they throw this at you. A completely unrelated story that does nothing to advance the main plot. This isn't just a short subplot either, it's its own act. One of the shortest acts, shorter than Act 1, but still an act nonetheless. Now, this seems like it would be downright infuriating, but this intermission is legitimately one of the best parts of the entire comic. Let me set the scene. This intermission starts with the Midnight Crew, who were actually built up this entire time. As a running guest, the kids would check MSPainAdventures.com, you know, the website Homestuck was originally on, and the comic being hosted was none other than the Midnight Crew. And yes, one of the Midnight Crew members checks the website and sees Homestuck. Also, when I said this intermission was completely unrelated to the rest of the comic, that's only half true. It's connected, we just can't see how yet. Anyway, the Midnight Crew is a band of four criminals led by Spade Slick, who yes, is connected to Jack Noir, which again, is cleverly foreshadowed. They've vowed revenge on a rival gang, the Felt, for burning down their casino. So they break into the Felt's mansion and set out to kill all 15 of their members and their boss, Lord English. This intermission has no dialogue and is told solely through the narration, yet all of the Midnight crew members have clear personalities. The chapter also gives you a lot to keep track of between the perspectives of the Midnight crew members, Spade's irrational quest to destroy all the clocks in the mansion, and of course, the Felt members. Each member of the Felt has a special ability and all of them involve time in one way or another. As a result, things keep getting crazier as the act progresses and more characters and powers are introduced. And since this is such a crazy world, the humor is even more trollish and bizarre than usual, making the act hilarious but never detracting from all the interesting stuff going on. The complexity involving the felt is also perfectly paced. It's really interesting to follow but not so complicated that you lose track of what's going on. This intermission is the perfect length too. When it ended, I was satisfied with the content I got and ready to move on. Really, the best way to describe this act is fun, interesting chaos. Also, I should probably explain this now, the act names are going to get more confusing as we go along, so for the sake of convenience, I'm going to refer to any segment of the story that warrants being separated on the story map as a chapter. You may not see the need for this now, but believe me, you will. Anyway, on to act four. 
Uh, like I've been saying for a while now, Act 4 is where things really go to the next level, and the chapter makes this abundantly clear as early as the first page. How so? It's very simple, really. The comic's title no longer applies. John actually leaves his house. I mean, technically he's been outside before, but he was still on his property. Here, for the first time in the comic, John actually leaves and goes to explore the world his house has been moved to. It essentially says, yeah, the prologue's done. We're actually going to explore the game world now. While I still think Acts 2 and 3 were well paced, I will admit it's a bit odd this didn't happen sooner. Luckily, it's well worth the wait. The chapter doesn't just show John exploring, it starts with another interactive flash, similar to the one in Act 2, but with even more content. It lets you explore the world, fight enemies, talk to NPCs, and learn more about the lore of Suburb. Also like the game in Act 2, this one doesn't work. They do the same thing of showing you all the still images you'd need, and letting you play the music, but that's it. Really, when it comes to both of these, I have to ask, why? Why did they do it this way? I get why they didn't port the game to HTML5. I'm disappointed that they didn't, but I still get why. It likely would have been a lot of work. You know what wouldn't have been a lot of work? Recording someone playing the game and embedding that video in the page. That's what they did for all the other interactive flashes that didn't get ported over, and those flashes still lost a lot from not being interactive, but at least you can see what the original experience was like. Here, it's like they took the adaptation for the books and slapped it into the comics, so now you can't even see the original experience through official means. Speaking of which, it would probably be best if they let us download the original files for these games. That would be a really easy way to let some readers get the original experience. Sure, not everyone would be able to run them, but it's still helpful and arguably kind of important as far as preservation is concerned. It's a shame too, because this Flash was a really big deal for the comic when it came out, and now it isn't even properly preserved. After this, the act shifts into continuing all of its plot lines. To start with, there's Jade, who just got her hands on a copy of Suburb and is now helping Dave enter the game. She literally does some of it while she's asleep, which is pretty hilarious. They also make some upgrades to the Alchemizer, which both look really cool and feel like upgrades you'd find in an actual video game. Then we have the people out in the desert. After a shootout with the aimless renegade, they all make up and hang out with each other. Another figure also shows up, which raises the question of who these guys are and what their role in the story is. Well, as it turns out, they're all part of Suburb. Specifically, they were members of the two warring kingdoms mentioned in Act 2, and now we get to see what they did back in the game. Just like in Act 3, there's a lot of time differences to keep track of with these guys, and it's even more interesting this time thanks to John's birthday present. This thing has been built up since Act 1, but it got lost before John could open it in Act 2. Now, we get to see what happened to it, how many times it changed hands, and the insane journey the peregrine mendicant had to go through just to get it to him. So you better believe it's satisfying once we see what's in the box. Rose probably does the least of anyone in this chapter. She explores the game world, kills enemies in ways far more brutal than John could have imagined, and has a fun alchemization segment that actually predicted Google Glass in a weird way. Oh, and Dave has an alchemization segment immediately after Rose's. Oh yeah, Dave also makes it into the game this chapter. Kind of. It's a bit confusing. So now, there's one character I'm sure you're wondering about. Jack Noir. That's definitely who you were thinking of, right? In all seriousness, this chapter is where he really steps up as a villain. We get to see more of his life as a bureaucrat, his henchmen engaging in a bunch of espionage that leads to the creation of Beckworld, Jade's god dog, and of course, when Jack ascends. You see, about a third of the way through this act, and to cap off the first year of Homestuck, we get Jack ascend. This is what I consider to be the first truly great Flash and Homestuck. It shows other plot lines and has great music like the previous Flashes, but really steps things up and shows the key moment when Jack turns from a spiteful underling to a serious antagonist. Then of course, there's the trolls. A bunch of them contact the kids and we get to see their personalities and even sneak peeks at what they look like. They were foreshadowed in Act 3 and were actually really annoying there, but thankfully that's not the case anymore. I'm not gonna go too deep into their personalities as there's gonna be a much better opportunity for that very soon. All I'll say here is that they're mostly funny and interesting. Then of course, we have John's plotline. A lot happens here, so I'm just gonna go over the highlights. He comes across Jade's grandpa. Why he's in suburb, I have no idea. One of the trolls tricks John into getting himself killed, so Dave travels back in time to stop him, which begins Homestuck's obsession with time travel in alternate universes. There isn't much parallel universe talk here, but it becomes a big deal later on. 
Also, that Dave becomes part of our Dave's kernel sprite. Then, of course, there's the ectobiology segment, which gives us arguably the strangest, most memorable, and most important plot twist in all of Homestuck. You see, John finds a lab and uses it in a purifier like the one the wayward vagabond used back in Act 2. Specifically, he uses it on his Nana, Rose's mom, Dave's bro, and Jade's grandpa. Not intentionally, it just had those coordinates locked in. Each time results in some paradox slime that gets combined and forms eight babies. These babies are the four people I listed, as well as John, Rose, Dave, and Jade. John then gives them gifts and puts them on meteors, which sends them back to Earth via time portals. Yeah, you heard that right. The four main characters were actually born in this lab thanks to John as part of this game they were destined to play. John and Jade are brother and sister, as are Dave and Rose. Dave's bro is actually his dad, and John's dad is technically his brother. This absolutely blew my mind when I first saw it. As crazy as it is, it technically makes sense, and we get a good deal of flashbacks explaining how things played out once the meteors landed. Also, this is the perfect example of what I was saying earlier about Hussey being a great improviser. I know for a fact this twist wasn't planned from the beginning, but it's presented in a way that's so seamless, it seems like it had to have been planned. Finally, we finish off Act 4 with Descend, a fantastic flash that's even better than Jack Ascend. A ton of stuff happens. Some of the most notable events include Jack going on a rampage and Jade's dream self dying. Then we see a bit of the aftermath of the Flash, finally have the Chekhov's gun that is John's birthday present go off in glorious fashion, and that's Act 4. I know I keep saying this, but Act 4 was a serious step up. It's the first time we hear much from the trolls, and the first time we see much of Suburb. The plot feels more focused and certainly has more going on, but still isn't afraid to pause for the sake of some jokes. There's just more of a balance here between the story and the comedy, and I think that's a good thing. It also marks a bit of a transition point for Homestuck. It's when you stop hearing about stuff from early in the comic, like Silidexes and Echo Ladders, and start hearing about stuff like time travel and class specs. Want to know the biggest indication things have changed, though? It's my description of the chapter. I was able to give pretty good summaries of Acts 1 through 3. Sure, I wasn't able to bring up every detail of every joke, but I mentioned basically all of the story moments present. Here, there were so many major story moments that I skipped simply because it would take far too long to go through them all. I know I've said it a ton, but I have to one last time. Acts 1 through 3 are a lot of fun, but Act 4 is where Homestuck really hits its stride. So, since Act 4 was such a massive step up, what's Act 5 like? Well, Act 5 is so next level that it's about as long as everything that's come before it combined. It's so big, in fact, that the act itself is split up into two acts, the shorter of which is slightly longer than Act 4. Why is there a divide? Well, it's very simple. The story just introduced the trolls, a race of aliens who played the game our main characters are playing. That's not exactly something you can ignore or even gloss over. So Act 5, Act 1, yes, that's actually what it's called, is all about the trolls. It formally introduces them all, gives us an idea of what their homeworld and society was like, and shows shows us bits and pieces of their journey playing and winning Suburb, or Sugrub as they call it. Unlike the humans who had four people playing, there's a grand total of 12 trolls. As a result, the introductions are a bit different. You still get the screen formally introducing them and listing off their interests, as well as a few pages of them going around doing random stuff, just like with the kids. However, these introductions are noticeably shorter. Not only did they get rid of a couple of running jokes that would seriously overstay their welcome if used 12 times in a chapter, but they also move on rather fast. If you ask me, these introductions are just the right length. They're long enough to give you an idea of each character's personality and daily life, but they also make the story in this chapter feel like it's moving at a breakneck pace. There are multiple times where they'll act like they're going to introduce a character, but fake you out, or maybe introduce another character entirely. Not to mention, they shroud a lot of the characters in mystery, just to keep you guessing. All of this is really clever, and could only really work in this chapter, so I'm glad they took advantage of this introduction structure. Sadly, not everything in this chapter is as well thought out as the introductions. You see, there's one major issue that seriously drags this chapter down. The dialogue. It's not bad. In fact, my gripe has nothing to do with the quality. It's about the quantity. The chat logs in this chapter are too freaking long. Don't get me wrong, I do like these characters, but Homestuck is a comic first and foremost. It's supposed to be a visual medium, so hitting us with walls of text like this really kills the vibe. 
It's not unbearable here, but it is a constant annoyance that drags the entire chapter down. Thankfully, they fixed this for 5-2, for the most part. Anyway, now that introductions are out of the way, time for introductions. You know what I mean. Time to go over each of the characters. Just so things make sense, I'm gonna go over them in the order they're introduced. The chapter starts off with Karkit Vantis, whose introduction is clearly meant to mirror John's in a lot of ways. Which is funny, because his personality clearly doesn't. Karkit is a rageaholic, plain and simple. He's always angry, often at himself above all else. That is, when he's not trying to lead everyone, or acting like an expert in troll romance despite never being in a successful relationship. Karkit winds up being a really funny and sympathetic character as the story goes on, but I'm not gonna lie, he is kind of annoying when the chapter first starts. Next is Gamzee Makara. The best way to describe Gamzee is a spiritual stoner clown. He constantly eats soap or slime, which is something you're not supposed to do, and gets high off of it. He also follows this strange religion that revolves around clowns and heavily involves Fago. Speaking of which, what a perfect example of how seamless Homestuck's pop culture references can be. When I first read this, I didn't even realize Fago was a real drink. I thought it was just something they made up, which just goes to show how naturally they can work these references into the comics world. Now, I'm not gonna lie, the beginning of this chapter is a bit dull. Karkin and Gamzee are good characters, but this chapter doesn't make a good case for them in the beginning. That all changes, though, with the introduction of the character who got John killed, Terezi Pyro. The first notable thing about Terezi, and basically the first thing we find out about her, is the fact she's blind. She still has a way of seeing, though, and it's the weirdest possible explanation they could have gone with. She has the ability to smell and taste colors, which is so strange you can't help but love it. She also has a strict sense of justice. Literally, the first thing we see her do is LARP as a prosecutor with her plush dragons, and it's hilarious. I'm just gonna say it now, Terezi is my favorite of the trolls and my second favorite character in the entire higher comic. She strikes a really nice balance between being the rational, serious one of the group and being such a goofy, lovable weirdo. She's also a pretty big troll, like in the internet way. It's pretty much an open secret that the trolls' personalities are all based off of people you tend to find online, at least to some extent. Pretty much whenever you hear someone bring up trolling in a positive context, that perfectly describes a lot of Terezi's personality. Like I hinted at earlier though, she also knows when to be serious and is actually one of the smartest people in the group, at least from a philosophical angle, which makes a lot of sense since she did want to be her world's equivalent of a lawyer before it got destroyed. Next is Solux Captor. He's a grumpy tech expert who suffers from mood swings and voices in his head. He's also the one who created Scrub and got everyone to play it, using texts from ancient ruins to develop the game. Despite the way I just described him, there isn't really much to Solux's character. He's pretty boring on his own and is only made interesting by outside factors like his knowledge of the game or his relationships with other characters. Which is actually fine, because the comic mostly limits his screen time to scenarios where he's interesting. After 5-1, when his purpose of organizing the game and getting everyone to play is fulfilled, he fades further and further into the background as the story goes. Besides, when you have this many characters introduced at once, not all of them are going to be winners. The only thing that really bothers me about Solux is his typing quirk. You see, for each of the trolls, they have a different typing gimmick whenever they talk. These quirks works vary in readability. You have easy ones like Karkit typing in all caps, ones that are manageable like Terezi's style of lead, and then you have ones that are just plain obnoxious like Solux. He uses twos as s's, writes every i twice, and spells the word two, t-w-o, in all contexts. I've been able to get used to most of the typing quirks, but this one still throws me off. Maybe it's because of a lack of screen time so I don't get used to it, or maybe it's uniquely bad. I'm not sure. As for how I feel about the typing quirks in general, I think they were a bad idea. Sure, some of them fit with the character's personality, but a lot of them are annoying and a needless barrier for new readers. You do get used to most of them after a while, though. Another thing involving troll dialogue I should probably talk about is the language they use. Obviously, they speak English, but not entirely. They have all sorts of weird names for ordinary objects. The style of these names feels consistent and is pretty charming. It really adds to 
the feel of this weird alien species that could only exist in something like Homestuck. Tavros Nitram is probably the most middle-of-the-road character in Homestuck in my eyes. He's a wimp in a wheelchair with self-esteem issues. He does have some legitimately funny moments, as well as some good serious ones, so I wouldn't call him boring, but I wouldn't really call him interesting either. Maybe it's because most of his screen time is dedicated to making you feel sorry for him, but he just didn't make that much of an impact on me. Aradia Megiddo is dead. Yeah, she's literally a ghost, for the same reason that Terezi's blind and Tavros is in a wheelchair. As a ghost, she literally doesn't care about anything and just does whatever she feels like she has to. You'd think that would make for a boring character, but she goes on a personal journey throughout Act 5 that's actually pretty satisfying to watch. This chapter also builds her up quite a bit before her introduction, constantly showing her and making you wonder what the hell her deal is. Nepita Liaison is what happens when you look at the troll lineup and say, you know what we need? A cat girl. I'm dead serious. Not only does Nepita have have an obsession with cats, but she also role plays in virtually every conversation, which is just adorable, especially when she gets her friends to play along. She's also obsessed with shipping her friends with each other, which is pretty hilarious. She's not completely sweet and innocent, though. She also lives in a cave in the middle of the woods, hunts animals with her claws, and paints the walls with their blood. Even still, she somehow manages to make that seem adorable. Nepita might not do much in the story, but she's a really cute, likable character which is probably why Hussey shows her dying every chance he gets. Vriska Circuit is a character I have very, very mixed thoughts on, and I'll be getting to those thoughts when they become relevant. For right now, I'll just focus on what you need to know. She used to LARP with Terezi, captured other trolls they defeated, and fed them to her giant spider Lucis. That's right, I haven't really explained Lucy yet. Every troll has an animal guardian that raises them, called a Lucis. Vriska's was a murderous spider that demanded Vriska bring her other trolls to eat, or else it would eat her. Her. Terezi turned a blind eye to this because she thought Vriska was only killing people who deserved it, but Vriska just fed it anyone she could find. Also, they split up due to the event that crippled Tavros, killed Aradia, blinded Terezi, and costed Vriska an arm and an eye. This event is hinted at for a while, and we're slowly shown bits and pieces of it as the chapter goes along. To put it simply, it was part of a large feud that Vriska started and was obviously in the wrong for, even though she was being manipulated at points by this guy, Mr. Vanilla. Vanilla Milkshake. That's not actually his name, but I'll explain who he really is later. All you need to know about him right now is that he types in white text, making his dialogue basically impossible to read without highlighting it. Anyway, back to Vriska. Long story short, she's psychic, she's a bitch, and she's hilarious. Before we get to the next character, I'm gonna need to explain something called the Hema Spectrum. You see, different trolls have different colors of blood. Those multicolor zodiac symbols on their shirts indicate their blood color. Not through some special technique technology or anything, most trolls usually just indicate their color through their fashion choices. There's a total of 11 different colors, and they correlate with overall physical strength and sometimes even psychic abilities. More importantly though, they make up a rigid and brutal caste system on their homeworld of Alternia. Fuchsia's at the top, only appearing in potential empresses, while Maroon is at the bottom, being the lowest blood cast allowed to live. Not only is a strict hierarchy enforced by the Hema Spectrum, but there are also major details about the different casts, such as Jade's being in charge of reproduction, high bloods like Gamzee often being unstable and violent, and the two highest casts living underwater for no reason other than they can, and they're so elite they feel the need to separate themselves from the rest of society. This does seem like a bit of a weird concept, but it's executed very well. I could gush about all the interesting ways Frensen built on this idea, but this review is about the main comic. And in Homestuck, while we barely see any of Alternian society, we do see the impact this system had on a lot of the characters, especially since each one of them is from a different cast. For example, Karkit wears gray, which isn't one of the blood colors, and that's because he is mutant blood, meaning if the Imperial drones ever found him, he'd be cold on sight. However, the character is probably most impactful impacted by the Hema Spectrum is Equius Zahak. Equius is near the top of the food chain on Alternia, the second highest caste of the land dwellers to be exact. 
He genuinely believes in the caste system, but constantly finds contradictions in it. He's got feelings for Aradia despite her being at the bottom of the Hema spectrum, and can't stand Gamzee because he doesn't embody the ideals of someone who's supposedly superior to him. He's also hilarious. Somehow he's a muscle-bound meathead, a robotics expert, and a cultural elitist all at the same time. It's such a weird combination, but it makes for some great comedy, especially with how legit creepy he can get, like getting turned on by having having low bloods order him around. He does genuinely care about his friends, despite being insanely racist towards them, which I think is a really interesting contrast. Just goes to show how badly a toxic ideology can screw someone up. After Aquaeus, the comic takes a bit of a break from introducing characters, so I might as well do the same to explain another major aspect of Alternia, romance. This is easily my biggest gripe when it comes to troll lore, and sadly, it's too central to ignore. You see, it's made abundantly clear that reproduction just just requires two trolls. Gender isn't a factor, and everyone in Alternia is essentially bisexual by default. So does that mean biological sex doesn't exist in Alternia, and that gender is just a matter of presentation? No, there are clearly physical differences, most notably female trolls have boobs and males don't, which makes very little sense because trolls don't nurse their young. So what are their boobs even for, biologically speaking? Actually, we almost find out late in the comic, but the character talking about it gets cut off before he can explain. I know it sounds weird to harp away on troll titties, but they're the ones who raised the question. I'm just asking it. The point I'm trying to make here is that the comic makes it clear gender works differently for trolls than it does for humans, but doesn't explain how it's different. Not only is leaving a question this obvious unanswered for no reason an issue, it's also a missed opportunity. Like I explained earlier, the Hema Spectrum was a really clever, creative, and effective way to look at race and class issues. Given Given what we know about troll gender, it could have been developed into something just as interesting. How does sexual dimorphism work in a species that has no need for it? How does gender presentation develop in a society where biological sex is irrelevant? Hell, Friendship introduces trans and non-binary trolls, which sounds cool, but shouldn't we have an idea of what gender actually means to this society before introducing characters who aren't happy with theirs? Instead of these burning questions being answered, we're given the overly complicated and honestly pretty stupid quadrant system. Basically, troll romance is split up into four quadrants, each represented by one of the suits in a deck of cards. The heart represents matespritship, which is basically just regular human romance. The spade represents kiss nemesis tune, which is romantic hatred. In addition to being impossible to pronounce, the idea is just really bad. I'm not going to explain why now, because there's an example later down the line that proves my point perfectly. The club represents auspicism. Autism. Basically, someone serving as a mediator for a spades cup. This idea is complicated, really poorly explained, and we never see a proper example in action. Finally, we have the diamond, representing more allegiance. This one's a bit more platonic than the others. It's essentially two best friends, only closer. Like, their main purpose of being together is to help the other be a better person by keeping their worst qualities in check. Okay, I actually like this one. I think it's stupid that it's counted as romance, and it's probably only like that to give the shippers something else to work with, but if the quadrant system didn't exist, and this was just considered some sort of cultural practice trolls do, I would have zero issues with it. It's an interesting idea, and it's used decently well in the story, although I would have liked to see a bit more of it. Anyway, back to introductions. We still have three more to go. Kanaya Mariam's introduction is kind of weird in hindsight. They try to draw a lot of parallels to Jade, like Kanaya having a lunch top just like hers and living in a very similar looking house. It's a clever pun since Kanaya's a Jade blood, but she's far more similar to Rose. They're both very snarky and intellectual, and from their first conversation in Act 4, you want to see them together. Maybe romantically, or maybe just as close friends, but you very much want to see them together. The way they play mind games to try and one-up each other, or give each other the chance to one-up them, is really cute and fun to watch. While it is kind of easy to just remember Kanaya as Rose's girlfriend, there's a good deal more to her character than that. Since she's a Jade, she was the one tasked with securing the future of her species after Alternia got destroyed, and that responsibility becomes her main driving force throughout the whole comic. Plus, she's really into fashion and down-to-earth enough to serve as a nice contrast to some of the more eccentric characters. Aridin Ampora barely gets any screen time. He's introduced late in 5.1 and only has a few appearances in 5.2 before he leaves the story entirely. There is some stuff I want to say about him, but I think there's a better time for that than now. 
Finally, we have Feffery Pyxies. Feffery's next in line to rule Alternia, assuming she can defeat the current Empress, and she wants to change the system entirely. Instead of subjugating the weak, she wants the Empire to care for those who can't care for themselves. Now, this sounds like an interesting idea, especially with her needing to find a new purpose now that the Empire she was supposed to rule has been destroyed. The only problem is, they barely do anything with Feffery. The whole finding another purpose thing I mentioned isn't actually a thing in the story. It's just the next logical step in her arc that I came up with while writing this. Despite Aridin having less screen time, Feffery probably does less than any of the other trolls. She's nice to people, makes fish puns, and has a text quirk that's as annoying as Solux's. And that's about it. Which is a real shame because they could have done so much with this character, but they just didn't. Alright, so now that I'm done going over these characters individually, how are they as a group? Well, their dynamic is essentially the opposite of the main four. While that dynamic was great because of its simplicity, this is great because of its complexity. You can pick basically any character of the bunch and find at least three characters they have very different relationships with. Sure, we don't know how everyone feels about everyone, but we don't need to. And with introductions out of the way, we're pretty much done with the chapter. It feels weird, but most of this chapter was introducing characters, and I still managed to find a way to talk about the stuff that wasn't. The only thing left to talk about is Sagrub. While we don't see the entirety of the trolls experience playing the game, as that would take way too long, we do see some segments of it. These little bits and pieces are enough to give us a good idea of what the session was like. Even in these truncated segments, we see so much of what happened between these characters. It's all a lot of fun and really makes you sad when you find out they lose in the end. All right, here we are at the big one. Act 5, Act 2 is easily the longest chapter in all of Homestuck. If you combine the lengths of Acts 4 and 5, 1, this is still longer. It makes sense why. After all, it takes all the plot lines of Acts 4 and adds the trolls. So many things happen and there are so many characters to keep track of. This could easily result in a bloated mess, but it doesn't. The chapter is well paced for the most part. It knows how to properly balance all the plot lines and most of the events in characters are really interesting. As a result, this is easily my favorite chapter in all of Homestuck. For the sake of time, I can't go into everything that happens, but I will be gushing about a lot. Because man, this chapter is awesome. It starts with a flash showing John growing up and Karkit resenting him every step of the way. Okay, I should probably explain. The trolls have access to a chat client similar to the one the humans use. The only difference is, are they can send these messages to any point in the target's timeline and they can see what their target is doing via a viewport. More importantly though, is why Karkit is so pissed at John. You see, by this point, it's been made clear that not only do the kids lose the game, but they screw up so badly it causes the trolls to lose too. This creates some great suspense for the chapter because we don't know how they screwed up yet. And even after we figure it out, there's still the matter of the countdown timer. Midway through the chapter, we start seeing a timer counting down to a mysterious event. It's really suspenseful, serves as a great framing device, and you start to get more and more of an idea of what this event is as the chapter progresses. Now that all that's established, let's get on to the plot lines. Starting with the Exiles, there's not much to say about them. The Windswept Questant, who used to be the White Queen, trains the Peregrine Mendicant to be the leader of the New World, and the Wayward Vagabond gets locked in one of the buildings as the Aimless Renegade plans to blow them all up. Once again, this is the least interesting plot line of the bunch, but it also has the least time dedicated to it, so no real problems here. One thing I should talk about before getting into the kids' plot lines is the way they connect to the trolls. While each kid gets contacted by multiple trolls, they each have one that talks to them on a regular basis throughout the chapter. This is a really smart move, as it gives the trolls something to do and the humans someone to interact with. Anyway, let's start with Rose's plot line. As you've probably guessed, she has Kanaya contacting her. Like I said, the two of them have a bunch of intellectual sparring matches with each other, which wind up being kind of funny and pretty sweet. What's significantly less sweet is what happens with Rose as the chapter goes on. Once she finds out her session is doomed, she goes on a rampage, tearing her world apart and using dark magic to find a solution. She gets less snarky and more esoteric as the chapter goes on, to the point where John, Kanaya, and even Aradia get worried that she's messing with forces beyond her control. She gets a lot 
of answers from talking with Mr. Vanilla Milkshake and through her powers. Which reminds me, I really need to talk about class facts. I haven't talked about a lot of the mechanics in Suburb, just because it would take too long to go over them all, but class specs are so central that I just can't ignore them. You see, each player in Suburb is given both a class and an aspect. The aspects are elements the players are able to control, and the classes govern how they're able to use them. Now, when I say element, I don't mean something simple like Avatar or even Okami. There's a total of 12 aspects. Breath, Life, Light, Time, Heart, Rage, Blood, Doom, Void, Space, Mind, and Hope. Not only are these aspects about as random as you can imagine, but even the official descriptions of them are vague. A few of them are self-explanatory, like time, but most of them could mean any number of things depending on the circumstances. Hell, we never even see what doom, rage, and blood do. Now, this might not have been so bad if it weren't for the classes. The classes are even more poorly explained. We don't even know what each one does or the rules governing them. Like, we know damn well what a seer does thanks to Rose and Therese, and a vague idea of what a few of the others entail, but that's about it. It's to the point where some of the classes straight up have conflicting information about them online. I will say, class specs are cool from a fandom perspective. In fact, there's an official Homestuck quiz to determine what your aspect would be, but not your class for some reason. From a storytelling perspective, though, class specs are a terrible idea. You can't have a system this overly complicated if you don't explain it well and make it front and center. And you especially can't have a system this complicated in a story that already has a ton of complicated systems in it. Now, the class spec system doesn't hurt the story much in this chapter since it's not talked about that much. But class specs get more and more attention as the comic and the franchise as a whole move along. And it becomes increasingly clear that despite putting such a big focus on them, even the writers don't understand how they work. Now for Dave. He spends his time on his planet scamming the locals out of their hard-earned cash by manipulating the stock market with his time powers. It's a weird idea, but it works. He's being led on this journey by Terezi, which is a clever idea, pairing up the hipster and the internet troll, and they work off of each other pretty well. There's a lot of comedic stuff, with the two of them sending terrible artwork to each other, and a lot of serious stuff, with Terezi venting to Dave about Vriska and explaining how timelines work in Suburb. Which reminds me, I should probably do that too. You see, in Suburb, and yes, I said Suburb, this only affects people playing the game, timelines operate off of the multi multiverse theory. However, there's one big difference between this and other media that uses the multiverse theory like Rick and Morty or Zero Escape. Here, not all timelines are created equal. There's an alpha timeline with a specific set of events that need to be followed. The moment a universe diverges from these events, it becomes a doomed timeline and collapses shortly afterward. The players in that timeline do continue to exist as ghosts living inside of dream bubbles, but that's about it. They didn't do what they were supposed to, so they failed and now they're all dead. Even if you personally achieved more than in the alpha timeline, it wasn't what was supposed to happen, so you get punished for it. I get that they need to keep time paradoxes under control, but it feels weird to put something this fatalistic in the story. In fact, they even discuss how screwed up it is in later chapters. While once again, it's not a huge problem in 5.2, I'm not a fan of the way this was handled, mainly because it leads to a lot of timeline discussions that are only rivaled by zero escape in terms of how annoyingly complicated and esoteric they are. Next is Jade's plotline. There's a lot that happens in Jade's plot. For starters, there's when she enters the game. I will admit, this chapter is a bit slow and can be kinda long-winded with its dialogue in the beginning, but all those problems melt away once Jade enters. Not only is it awesome and the first of the three big animations in this chapter, but things just get more exciting afterward. One of the main reasons for this is that the Flash shows us exactly why the session fails. Due to some mistakes being made, Beck prototypes himself with the Colonel, leading to all the enemies in the game getting his powers, including Jack Noir. This turns Jack from a formidable opponent to an absolutely unstoppable killing machine who is able to travel to the Trolls session and rob them of their victory at the last second. Speaking of which, one of the best things about Act 5 in general is its selection of villains. 
villains. While the story got this far with very few villains, Act 5 has a ton of great ones, the first of which is Jack Noir. He's really intimidating, being both incredibly powerful and ruthless, but also kind of funny. Not only is he as hilariously petty and angry as before, but now that Beck's a part of him, he has a soft spot for Jade, and it's really funny seeing that part of him conflict with his killer instincts. But enough about Jack, back to Jade's plot. She mostly interacts with Tavros in the beginning, and it's pretty sweet. Jade legitimately tries to help Tavros with his self-esteem issues, but also calls him out when he's being legitimately creepy. However, due to reasons I'll explain later, Tavros gets switched with Karkit midway through, and seeing his and Jade's polar opposite personalities bounce off of each other is pretty funny. Karkit also softens up a lot over the course of the chapter, and he and Jade work together to craft a plan so they can all escape this failed session. As for the other stuff she does here, she revives her dream self to try and fight Jack, which doesn't work. She has a fun alchemization segment, and starts breeding frogs to create the perfect universe. That's right, the whole point of Suburb is to create a whole new universe. I'm not even going to address that fact, I'm just gonna leave it right there. John's plotline sees him paired up with Vriska, and man, this is where Vriska really shines. Remember when I said I had very complicated thoughts on her? Well, it's nothing but positive stuff here. Vriska is such a good villain in this chapter. She starts off unassuming enough, seeming like she just wants to help John succeed. Sure, she might be a bit pushy, but that's it. However, as the chapter goes along, you start to see the parallels between the way she treats John and the way she treated Tavros, and you start to realize just how manipulative and outright predatory she is. Remember how Beck took over the Colonel? Well, that only happened because Vriska put John to sleep. She flat out tells John this and manages to spin it so it sounds like it's no big deal. But at the same time, her motive kinda makes sense, at least from her perspective. After all, she clearly knew Jack would become all-powerful since he wrecked her session, so she wanted to be part of his rise to power. That way, she could feel even cooler when she finally killed him. It makes sense, in a sort of nonsensical way. So, Frisk is a manipulative egomaniac, right? Well, yeah, but that's not all there is to her. As the chapter goes on, we start to see her have doubts. She confides to John that despite the fact she's determined to take down Jack herself, which is confirmed in-universe to be a terrible idea, by the way, she still has worries. She mentions how rough she had it with Spider-Mom, and that she even feels bad about what she did to Tavros, despite everything she's been taught from birth saying that he had it coming and deserved to die. We'll get to that in a second. She's still a chillingly manipulative narcissist, but in some ways, it's tough not to feel bad for her. And by the end of the chapter, even though she still decides to go through with her plan to kill Jack, it seems like she really wants to change once the deed is done. It makes for a really complex and interesting villain. As for the rest of John's plotline, he does a lot of stuff, sometimes with Vriska's help slash manipulation, and sometimes with guidance from his friends. He even ascends to God tier, which grants him conditional immortality. Basically, your death has to be ruled heroic or just for it to count. So you're golden as long as you only die in random, stupid, and otherwise non-plot relevant ways. Anyway, back to the whole Tavros dying thing. The second big flash of 5-2 is called Wake. A lot happens in it. We see how Jack went on a rampage, murdering the trolls' dream selves, and making it clear that they don't get a second chance if any of them die. We also see Aradia come back to life, which is awesome and really furthers her arc. And then of course, Vriska kills Tavros. Just for context, Tavros is already about to kill her because he found out about her creating Jack. But it's still Tavros. Vriska could have easily subdued him without killing him. He's not even used to having working legs. And this moment perfectly illustrates my indifference toward Tavros. When I look back, I can see how well this plays into Vriska's arc, and it is a tragic end for Tavros, but when I saw this, my reaction wasn't, oh no, poor Tavros. It was, holy crap, did that just happen? Are they killing characters now? Tavros seemed like he had plot armor. However, none of the things I just mentioned are the most notable part of the flash. No, that would be the music. Tell me if it sounds familiar. What? You didn't think we'd get through this review without talking about him, did you? Yeah, while he had worked on other projects beforehand, it's pretty well known by this point that Homestuck is where Toby Fox got his start. In fact, one of the reasons the Kickstarter for Undertale was so successful was because so many people knew about him from Homestuck. His role was contributing music to the comic. There have been plenty of other contributors, but he's responsible for most of the big ones. Almost every major flash after Act 3 has his involvement in some way. It kinda goes without saying, but the man 
man really is a talented composer. In fact, I'd argue that Megalovania is far from his best contribution to Homestuck. I honestly prefer tracks like Black, Descend, and English. I should also take this opportunity to mention the Bandcamp albums. As Homestuck was made, there were a bunch of albums released alongside the comic containing official Homestuck music from a variety of contributors. Some of these were used in the comic, but a lot of them weren't. I'd recommend checking them out. While some of the songs kinda suck, usually intentionally, most of them are pretty good. Homestuck's soundtrack has a unique feel to it, and it's nice to listen to when you're working on something else. Anyway, now for the trolls. There's a lot that happens with the trolls in this chapter, which makes perfect sense since there's 12 of them, so I'm just gonna go over the biggest stuff that isn't linked to any of the kids. Before talking about specific events, though, I need to talk about Alternia Bound. In 5-2, there's a series of interactive flashes that have you playing as one of the trolls, or sometimes one of the kids. They have you going around, talking to other characters, sometimes switching characters, and examining various items. These have been nicknamed, and maybe even officially called, Alternia Bound. These segments are great for so many reasons. The more detailed designs and animations look really good and fit the characters. There's a lot of good music, really putting the soundtrack to use. These segments also do a great job fleshing out the characters. It's a great way to get a lot more dialogue in without it feeling like they're assaulting the audience with text. Really, these segments feel like the final evolution of the games at the beginnings of Acts 2 and 4. Unlike those games though, these are properly preserved. You can't play them, but at least they use YouTube videos instead of whatever this was. It really is a shame though, as being able to play these things added a lot to the experience. Not only did the frequent ability to interact with things really change the feel of 5-2, but these segments use gameplay to make story beats hit you especially hard. And on that note, I want to talk about Aridin. Aridin was a violent blood, the highest cast on the Hema spectrum save for the Empress. As a result, he's always felt he's been entitled to everything and is just generally a really cruel guy. However, despite his status, he's unlucky with love. He was more ales with Feffery and wanted to be something more, but instead, she dumped him as soon as they entered the game. He's treated like a complete joke throughout the early parts of the act. He tries to hit on Rose and fails miserably, and Kanaya trains him in magic, mostly as a joke to mess with Rose. This all changes in one of the Alternia Bound segments. Right as Kanaya is about to leave the room, Aridin bursts in and heads over to Feffery, who's now dating his old rival, Solux. Aridin says he's been betraying the group to join Jack Noir and demands Feffery come with him. She obviously refuses, and when Aridin won't take no for an answer, Solux challenges him to a duel. Solux loses big time, and when Feffery's about to retaliate, Aridin kills her without hesitation. And then he does the same to Kanaya, right after destroying the only chance the trolls have at repopulating their species. Okay, I'll address what just happened in a second, but real quick, Aridin is seriously ahead of his time. Every single point I just listed about him fits the profile of an incel killer perfectly. And this was written back in 2011. I mean, I guess nice guy syndrome was already a prevalent thing back then, and I guess Aridin was designed as a satire of people like that by taking their mentality to its logical conclusion, but still, this plot point is aged amazingly. Anyway, back to its impact on the story itself. My jaw dropped when I first saw this. Not too long after they killed Tavros, they make it seem like they killed off three characters at once. Granted, Solux didn't actually die, and it turns out Kanaya didn't either, but it still has the same impact in the moment. It all happens so disturbingly quick, you don't have time to process what's going on until it's over. It really leaves you feeling like Karkit afterwards. Speaking of Karkit, this incident shows a whole new side of him. Up until this point, Karkit came off as so spiteful and angry, it didn't seem like he would care if one of his crewmates wound up dead. However, that couldn't be further from the truth. You can practically hear the panic and sadness in his voice when he's standing over Kanaya's body. The same goes for when he lashes out at Aridin. He contacts past Aridin, and despite this being a comedic setup, since Aridin has no way of knowing what Karkit's talking about, all you can focus on is the pain in Karkit's words. And if you thought things couldn't get any worse, nope. We're just getting started. Immediately after examining the bodies, before even contacting Aridin, Karkit gets a cryptic warning from Mr. Vanilla Milkshake, and then a message from Gamzee. This isn't one of Gamzee's soper-induced ramblings, though. In fact, he's run out of soper, which was the only thing keeping him under control. And now, having been driven crazy by a number of factors, he's planning to kill everyone on the meteor. Afterward, we get a pretty hilarious scene of Terezi doing a mock investigation on Tavros's 
body, coupled with the much less hilarious knowledge that Gamzee's somewhere near her. Although we find out she's okay pretty damn fast with her performing some hilariously bad investigations on the other murders. Meanwhile, with Solux knocked out and Terezi nowhere to be found, Karkin only has one person he can turn to. He contacts Equius, hoping he can do something about all this chaos, and then we're greeted by a flash unlike anything else in Homestuck. It's an alternate about segment, just like the others. It starts off with Equius and Napita discussing the current situation. One thing that's interesting to note is that early in 5-1, their relationship comes off as creepy and borderline abusive. But as the story goes along, you realize they couldn't be further from the case. These two are really close friends who genuinely care for each other, even if Equius has a weird way of showing it at times. Anyway, we get to see the two play off each other a bit before Equius tells Napita to hide in the vents in case Gamzee shows up. Inside the vents, we get to see some pretty cute drawings of Napita's ships, some of which sadly don't work anymore. Another thing I'd like to make note of are Equius and Napita's themes. Both of them are fun, energetic, and really fitting for the characters. I bring this up because it makes for some great total whiplash. As Napita gets closer to something she shouldn't see, the music turns dark and sinister with some faint honking in the background, and it stays that way when it switches back to Equius. However, once Equius finds Gamzee, the music goes from eerie to terrifying. This creepy circus music starts playing, and you see Gamzee's jagged silhouette, illuminated only by the glasses he stole from Terezi. Equius tries to calm Gamzee down, but he won't listen, and instead shoots Equius in the leg. Napita's is not about to take this lying down and retaliates against Gamzee, only for him to kill her too. The reason I say this moment is different from anything else in Homestuck is pretty simple. I felt a lot of emotions my first time reading the comic, but this was the only time I felt legitimate fear. You're already on edge after what happened with Aridin, and then they hit you with this atmospheric powerhouse. Also, just a fun fact, when I first got to this part, it was October 2016. You know, when that whole scary clown epidemic was going around? Remember Remember that? God 2016 was weird. Now, I've seen people say that Gamzee killing these two so easily is kind of far-fetched. After all, Nipita grew up hunting wild animals with her bare claws, yet she couldn't escape from Gamzee? Equius constantly sparred with robots and was too strong to fire an arrow or drink a glass of milk, yet Gamzee's able to strangle him no problem? Yeah, he has superior high blood strength, but he also spent god knows how long destroying his brain with Soper Slime. Would he really be a match for these? These, two? these criticisms are valid, but I don't think they take away from the impact of this scene. Also, Vriska, Aridin, and Gamzee all meet up, but before they can fight, Kanaya comes out of nowhere. Turns out she's a rainbow drinker, the troll version of a vampire, so she's not actually dead and she glows in the dark. Yeah, it's not especially well explained. She incapacitates Vriska and Gamzee and straight up kills Aridin. I mean, he tried to kill her. Fair's fair. Now that most of the death's out of the way, I might as well talk about them as a whole. I'm kinda torn here. On one hand, they're really impactful in the moment. This was one of the most memorable parts of Homestuck for me. These aren't overly telegraphed Hollywood deaths, they're mostly unpredictable and chillingly fast. On the flip side, though, I'm not sure how good they were in the long run. I get the instinct to start killing when you have this many characters to deal with, but these are all interesting characters who I felt they could have done a lot more with. Sure, they're not out of the story entirely thanks to the dream bubbles, but they're mostly relegated to background roles. Except Tavros. He actually gets a good amount of screen time. The other four, though, are pretty limited in what they can do, and I think killing them cut the story off from a lot of interesting possibilities. Anyway, enough about the trolls. Let's get back to the others. At one point in this chapter, John's dad and Rose's mom meet up at a castle for a nice relaxing lunch. Given the fact all the trolls Lucide died before they started the game, and that Jack's already killed bro, it should be clear this meal doesn't stay relaxing. In fact, we get to see the aftermath from Jack's perspective, making it abundantly clear what he did. Rose sees what happened, and we see her black out on Kanaya's monitor. And then boom, she gives in to the darkness, and grim dark Rose is born. John goes to investigate after seeing a dark cloud swirling around the castle, and we get another Alternia Bound segment. Starts off with an incredibly atmospheric opening, and then we get to play as Grim Dark Rose. The music here is amazing, and the atmosphere is tense, but that doesn't stop them from telling some jokes. My personal favorite is when John tries to talk to Rose, but she just responds with eldritch babbling. Also, I should probably talk about what I meant earlier when I said these games make the story beats hit especially hard. 
They force you to do a lot of unpleasant things, making the consequences hit even harder. It makes it so you're the one who led Aridin into his confrontation with Solux. You're the one who led Equius and Napita to their deaths. And in this case, you're the one who led poor, sweet, innocent John to his father's bloody corpse. This results in a confrontation with Jack Noir, where John dies almost instantly. Anyway, now back to the trolls. Terezi's found all the bodies, and somehow came to the conclusion that Frisk is responsible for all of them. We get a flashback of some of the trolls' ancestors who ran into a similar situation, and Terezi goes to confront Vriska in a clever callback to Dave confronting Bro. When they meet, Terezi points out that Vriska's plan to kill Jack is awful, as it'll just lead him right back to the meteor there on. This whole flash keeps glitching out and crashes thanks to some weird fourth wall stuff. Luckily, there is someone who can fix this. Doc Scratch, also known as White Text Guy and Mr. Vanilla Milkshake. We've actually known his real name since 5-1, but I figured I'd play up the nickname a bit. You essentially spend the rest of 5-2 inside of Scratch's study, and it's a very different experience from the rest of the chapter. The webpage even reflects this, turning green to match the decor and make the white text readable. Before we get to what happens in this segment, though, I have to talk about about Scratch himself. Jack and Vriska are both great villains, but Doc Scratch somehow manages to outclass both of them. Scratch is a first guardian, much like Beckworld, but instead of raw destructive power, his weapon is his intellect. The dude is basically omniscient. There are a few things he doesn't know, but those are rare exceptions. He's also the only character other than Hussey's literal self-insert who's aware of the fourth wall. He has this air of class and sophistication to him, always dressing sharp and insisting he's an excellent host. It's kind of funny. Scratch has all the makings of a really annoying character. He's arrogant, long-winded, and constantly gets off topic. However, he has this way of speaking that makes it so you just don't care. The tangents this guy goes on are both witty and fascinating. He could read a phone book and make it sound interesting. His main goal is to die so his master, Lord English, can be unleashed. Yes, that Lord English. I told you the Midnight Crew arc would come into play. Spade Slick even shows up in Scratch's apartment. Anyway, enough about Scratch himself. What happens in his segment? Well, it starts with him explaining what you missed when things glitched out. The artwork is really stylish, and Scratch is an engaging storyteller. He even bothers to remind you of important details you may have forgotten earlier. He draws a clever parallel between Rose and Vriska, both of whom challenge Jack and have it backfire royally. While this story plays out, we actually get another one alongside it, with Spade Slick busting into the apartment and causing chaos on the upper banner of the screen. The way the antics in the apartment interact with the main story is pretty clever, especially when it comes to Vriska's death. After Terezi stabs Vriska to prevent her from getting them all killed, we see Vriska's chat message to John, talking about how she's scared to fight Jack, but she still thinks it needs to be done, and that she's looking forward to settling down and becoming a better person afterward. And then, right as we're about to see her judgment on Scratch's clock, Spades hits it with a crowbar and it rules her death just, cutting off her means of resurrection. This is really clever, because these rules are so new, and Vriska seems so morally ambiguous that you don't actually know if the clock ruled her death on its own, or if it was because of Spade's interference. At this point, between the chat logs, upper banner, and pictures, we're actually getting three separate stories at the same time. John contacting people, Dave and Jade fighting Jack, and Scratch beating up Spades. It's a clever way to go about telling the story, but it can be a bit hard to follow. Eventually, Scratch just leaves his scrapbook out and lets you go through it. Every picture in the book can be clicked on to take you to a side story, catching you up with different characters. The way this is presented does feel a bit overwhelming at first, but the stories themselves are good, tie up some important loose ends, and the segment ends right as it's about to overstay its welcome. Once it's over, we get a good deal of exposition. First, Scratch explains the Scratch, which is the maneuver the kids are trying to pull off in order to escape their dying session. Specifically, he explains that the trolls had done it before, and the troll session we know was actually the second attempt. The original trolls were actually the ancestors of the ones we know now. When they pulled off the Scratch, their entire universe was reset with two major changes. One was flipping the meteors, and the other was Doc Scratch. The original troll planet was actually quite peaceful. The entire reason Alternia is such a violent hellhole is because Scratch made it that way to toughen up the heroes and increase their chances of victory. Then, he tells the story of the suffering.
sufferer, who's essentially Alternian Jesus. The story is technically pointless, but it does add a lot. It builds on the troll lore, incorporates the rest of the troll's ancestors, once again having them parallel their descendants in clever ways, and explains the symbol on Karkit's shirt. Scratch then starts talking about the Empress of Alternia also known as the Condes, and makes it clear what's going to happen when the kids scratch their session. The exact same thing that happened with the trolls, only instead of Scratch and Damara tormenting Earth, it'll be the Condes and Lord English. Then, right as the Scratch segment is about to overstay its welcome, it ends due to the strangest involvement from Hussey's self-insert yet, and we're back to the main story. A couple things happen, and then we get the final flash. Cascade. I'm just gonna say it now, Cascade is the greatest moment in all of Homestuck. Nothing before or since has been able to match it. The funny part is, watching it out of context, it's really not that special. Even if you've read the comic before and are re-watching it just for kicks, it's fine, but nothing amazing. But whenever you get to it through organically reading the story, it's pure perfection. While none of the previous animations cracked five minutes, this one is 13. All the disparate pieces of this incredibly long chapter come together perfectly. It's cinematic, and seeing all these complex plot lines interacting with each other in unexpected ways is absolutely glorious to watch. I only have two issues with The Flash, and one of them isn't even its fault. You see, it messed with the borders of the webpage, which was really cool and signaled how next level this Flash was. But now that it's just an embedded YouTube video, you can't really recapture the magic. My only issue with the Flash itself is Jade. Her detailed design looks really awkward toward the end, and her merging with Beck, while really cool in the moment, kinda bites the story in the ass later down the road. Aside from that though, Cascade is amazing. Overall, Act 5-2 is fantastic. It's got a ton of plot lines and characters, but manages to balance them really well. It also manages to balance tone really well, having the perfect mix of humor and seriousness. Tons of stuff happens, and while the chapter has a few dull moments, they're all few, far between, and not even that bad. The characters really get fleshed out, and of course, there's that amazing finale. After such a massive climax of so many chapters, I should probably let you know we're only halfway through the comic, and it's all downhill from here. Before we get into that though, there's one more thing we need to talk about. The second intermission. I couldn't include it in the 5-2 segment because technically it's not part of Act 5. When I saw this, I was excited. After how great the Midnight Crew arc was, I was expecting something similar. Instead, we just get a flash. Which isn't bad, honestly it's kind of my fault for assuming. You see, in 5.1, Solux had a virus on his computer that was designed to execute once the universe ended. It wasn't clear what it did, and there was no way to stop it from going off. So, now that the Trolls universe has been destroyed, we get to see its effects. It gruesomely transforms Doc Scratch into Lord English. The whole Flash has this really sinister vibe to it, and serves as a nice, dark counterpart to Cascade. The music is fantastic, and fits the scene perfectly. It's a really nice mix of eerie and suspenseful that hits the point home. I gotta say though, Lord English's design is kinda disappointing. It's better when we get a clear view of it, but here it looks pretty generic which is the last thing you want when replacing a design as unique as Doc Scratch. That's all I have to say, really. It's just one flash. On to Act 6. Since Act 5 was so long, you'd think they'd shorten things a bit just so the acts aren't so overwhelming, right? Well, yes and no. The chapters from here on out are shorter. Nothing really matches 5-2 in terms of page count. At the same time, though, Act 6 is much longer than Act 5. In fact, it's basically the entire rest of the comic. So yeah, if you thought calling things things Act 5, Act 1 was dumb, don't worry. The naming conventions for these chapters become so, so much dumber. As you probably guessed, this is the reason I call them chapters. Anyway, on to Act 6, Act 1. So, remember what Scratch said would happen with the Scratch? Well, I went into the nitty gritty of it for a reason. Earth has been reset, but with the main four swapping places with their guardians. So now, we're following a different main four in this new world. John's Nana, Rose's mom, Dave's bro, and Jade's grandpa. The act opens with a flash showing this new reality, giving a glimpse of the brand new world. The flash is alright. It's nothing special, but it's okay. 
way. Since I've already made it clear that I don't like Act 6, I might as well list off my issues now instead of keeping you in suspense. Especially since there isn't that much that actually happens in 6-1. While there are a lot of small problems with Act 6, there are four big ones that I like to call Act 6's poison. These issues start off small, but intensify as things progress, slowly killing the comic. And I do mean slowly. They get worse at such a slow rate, you'll be pretty far along before you realize anything's wrong. So, what are these problems? Poison number one is poorly thought out plot progression, but there's not much to say about that here, so let's move on. Poison number two is poor characterization. I'm not gonna mince words, most of the characters introduced in Act 6 suck, and most of the old characters are handled poorly too. On that note, might as well go over the characters introduced here. Jane Crocker, also known as John's Nana, is the heiress to the Betty Crocker baking empire. If you're confused, it was a running joke that John had an irrational hatred of Betty Crocker. So in this world, Crocker Corp is a sinister mega corporation with all sorts of insane technology. Anyway, back to Jane. Despite the comic drawing so many parallels between her and John, she actually has a lot more in common with Solox. As in, she doesn't have much of a personality and has to rely on outside plot points to keep her interesting. In Jane's case, this involves a boring, cliche love triangle and her relationship with Crocker Corp, which pretty much evaporates character-wise after she enters the game. Now, this kind of thing was fine with Solox because he was just a side character. You can't have one of your new main characters characters be this boring. The sad part is, the groundwork for a good character was here. Jane's shown to have an interest in detective work and baking, both of which can make for an interesting character, but neither of them shape her personality in any meaningful way like the original four. So you're just left with a boring, bog-standard teenage girl. Next is Jane's grandpa, Jake English. For starters, can I just say that these names were poorly thought out? I get what they were going for, making characters with similar names to their counterparts. The problem is that now we have three characters with names so phonetically similar it's tough to distinguish between them when talking. Seriously, Jane, Jake, and Jade all sound too similar. How did they not catch this? The other two newcomers don't have this problem. Anyway, Jake English is my least favorite character in all of Homestuck. Like I said, I don't like a lot of the characters in Act 6, but man does Jake take the gold. For starters, he's a total wimp. Yeah, Tavros was a wimp too, but he was the kind of guy you felt sorry for. Jake isn't. He manages to make Jerry Smith look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's whiny, socially oblivious to an obnoxious extent, and worst of all, is his speech pattern. For some godforsaken reason, Jake talks with this weird, old-timey dialect. He sounds like a parody of a parody of what people from the 1920s sound like. Now, this doesn't sound like a big deal. After all, most most characters in Homestuck have unique ways of talking, especially the trolls. The issue here is that the dialect is so intense it doesn't feel natural, and it's grafted onto a character who is pretty unlikable to begin with. Oh, and then there's his design. He's literally just John with a jacket. Sure, they have slightly different hair, but even then, I doubt you can remember the difference without looking. This wasn't an issue with the other new kids, so I don't know why it was so hard to get Jake right. Poison number three is a lack of charm. This one's the toughest to describe. The early chapters had this weird, goofy, unique charm that just screamed Homestuck. It's practically what gave the comic its identity. Acts 4 and 5 toned it down a bit to allow for a more serious, complex story, but it was still a big part of the comic. Like I said before, they had a good balance. Act 6 tips that scale way too far in the drama direction and loses pretty much all of the homestuckiness the first half of the comic had. We'll be seeing much more concrete examples later down the road, but you can still see it here. 6-1 is clearly trying to emulate Act 1, but it just doesn't recapture the same feeling, likely because it's just trying to move things along instead of engaging in a battle of wits with the reader. Finally, the most deadly of the bunch, poison number 4 is the word count. Remember when I complained about the chat? Chat logs in 5-1 being too long? Well, they're just as long, if not longer, in this chapter. And they only keep getting more verbose as the comic goes on. It's not just chat logs, either. Look at Jane's introduction page compared with John's. It's like five times the length, despite her having one-fifth of personality. Like I said before, comics are a visual medium, so constantly bombarding us with these walls of text really misses the point. It's also exhausting having to read so much, especially because so much of it could be condensed. They'll often have conversations 
conversations that could get the same point across with half the words at most. So with all four of those problems out of the way, what happens in 6-1? Well, Jane wants to get a copy of Suburb from the mailbox, but since she's the heiress to a powerful company, her dad won't let her leave the house due to possible assassination attempts. She probably should have listened to him since the chapter ends with her being blown up in a similar cliffhanger to Act 1. And yes, Jane's dad is an exact replica of John's dad, despite ectobiology not being involved with his creation. Try figuring that one out. Meanwhile, Jake has been working with Jade from the original universe to make John's birthday present, and now that it's finished, he needs to send it back to Jade, but his machine that lets him do so is all out of uranium, and the only place left he can find some is inside of the battle robot Dave's bro sent him. Speaking of which, we do hear quite a bit from the other new kids in this chapter. We even see them, but since they aren't formally introduced here, the story jumps through all sorts of hoops to avoid revealing their names, which is pretty clever. Another clever thing about this chapter is the character select screen. In a lot of cases here, as well as in 6.2 and 6.3, you'll have several characters doing things at once, and the comic will give you a character select screen so you can choose which plot you want to see first. It's not some earth-shattering addition or anything, but it is nice and adds a good feeling of interactivity to the comic. 6.1 as a whole was alright. It has all the major problems of Act 6, but they're pretty small here. The amounts of text are annoying, but not unbearable. We don't know enough about Jane and Jake to know for sure if they'll be bad characters, and while this chapter fails to recapture the same magic of Act 1, it at least has some of that charm. Just from reading this chapter, it seems like it could just be a minor bump in the road, when in reality, it's a harbinger of something much worse. So if we're focusing on this new universe now, what happened to the characters we spent the entire first half of the comic following? Well, that's what the intermissions are for. And yes, that's why Act 6 has such a convoluted structure. The regular acts are for the new kids, while the intermissions are for everyone else. I should probably mention that officially, the new kids are called the Alpha Kids, and the old ones are called the Beta Kids. I get this refers to the timelines, but I'm going to avoid using these terms just because it implies the Alpha Kids are better than the Beta Kids, which couldn't be further from the truth. Anyway, 6-1-B as I'm going to call it, is really just setting up what's going to happen in future intermissions, since you're bound to have questions after Cascade. The gang is heading into the new universe on separate ships. The trolls, Dave, Rose, and the mayor are on the meteor, while John, Jade, and all the game characters Jade brought with her are on a Prospatin battleship. The trip is three years long for all of them, and Solex and Aradia aren't coming. Instead, Arati is following her passion for dead things and serving as a sort of goddess of death for the dream bubbles. And Solex is going with her because why not? This was a smart decision. Both of them went through small arcs in Act 5 that wound up making them happier, more fulfilled people in the end, with Arati coming back to life and finding a purpose, and Solex losing his psionics, getting rid of the voices in his head for good. Both of these character stories have been told, and there's not much you can do with them on their own, so it makes sense to have them leave now that they've found their own happiness. Besides from that, though, there isn't much going on with this chapter. There are a couple of funny moments, particularly with Karkit, but that's about it. Really, this is one of the most forgettable chapters in the entire comic. Speaking of forgettable, 6-2 isn't much better in that department. Despite it being longer than the last two chapters, the only things from it I really remember are the introduction to the remaining two kids, so we might as well get those out of the way. These introductions happen pretty early in the chapter, and are done in the same way as Jane and Jake, one right after the other. Rose his mom, Roxy Lalonde, is actually pretty good. She's not on the same level as the original four, but she's easily the best of these new kids. She acts kind of like the mom of the group, trying to look after her friend's well-being, albeit in less than helpful ways sometimes. She's also an alcoholic, which leads to her frequently misspelling her words in some pretty hilarious ways. Overall, Roxy's a nice combo, mixing sweet and caring with goofy and eccentric. Sadly, I can't say the same about Dave's bro, Dirk Strider. Dirk is easily the most disappointing character in this whole comic. Judging from what we saw of him in Acts 2 and 3, it seemed like this guy would be really entertaining, and the general idea of him still kind of is. He's this super genius with all this advanced technology, and he combines Dave's hipstery attitude with Vriska's manipulative tendencies. Sadly, this doesn't actually lead to anything interesting. I hate to say it, but Dirk is kind of a Mary Sue. He knows the answer to pretty much everything his team needs to do, and is able to guide them through it with minimal effort. And it's not like he has any major weaknesses in other areas to balance this out. Unlike Dave, who had a whole host of awkwardness, insecurity, and genuine passion behind his layers of irony, Dirk is just kind of boring. In his interactions, he feels really elitist and dismissive of others, almost like he doesn't even care about his friends. It's not done in an entertaining way 
guy either. It's not like Vriska where she's openly sadistic. Dirk is just kind of cold and distant. He created an AI clone of himself to respond to his friend's messages when he's busy, and that AI is more likable than he is. The story does acknowledge that he's a bad friend, but once again, it doesn't really manifest in interesting ways. Aside from one exception we'll get to later. There is one more character who gets introduced in this chapter. Technically, she's not formally introduced until chapter 3, but given the way your introduction is handled, it makes more sense to talk about her here, at least personality-wise. Calliope and her brother, who we'll get to later, have a similar relationship with the Act 6 kids to what the trolls had with the original four. Unlike the trolls, though, Callie is really boring. Her entire personality consists of being afraid of her brother and giving tutorials about suburb, particularly when it comes to class bets. Yeah, those come back in full force here, and despite taking up much more time, they don't make any more sense. The worst part about Callie is that later on, we're expected to worry for her safety, but the story doesn't give us much of a reason to care whether she lives or dies. Anyway, what happens in the chapter itself? Well, Jane gets saved from the explosion by Godcat, who's this universe's first guardian. Unlike Beck and Doc Scratch, G-Cat doesn't have much of a role in the story. He's just kind of a get-out-of-jail free card for whenever Hussy needs something unpredictable to happen. Then, Dirk helps Jane set up and enter Suburb. Jane setting things up is glossed over for the most part, which I can kind of understand given how many times we've seen this song and dance. The other characters have their own plot lines they go through, but there's nothing really notable about most of them. Jack Noir and his people are now being led by the Condes and are moving fast to kill everyone's dream selves, leading to Jack getting captured. Roxy accidentally kills her cat, which turns out to be Jasper's, so she sends it back to Rose and we get a pretty nice montage of Jasper's full journey throughout the comic. There's a pretty hilarious scene of Jake fighting Dirk's battle bot and losing spectacularly. And then there's the love triangle. This chapter introduces a love triangle that consists of Dirk and Jane fighting over Jake. I'm sorry, what? These two might just be the most desperate teens alive if they're fighting over Jake English of all people. And that actually brings me to my big problem with the Act 6 kids dynamic. Like I said, the original four were really different, but their interactions made it so you never doubted they were friends. I don't get that from these four. I buy that Roxy cares about the others, but that's about it. Jake is so socially obtuse and annoying that I don't understand why anyone would stay in contact with him. Dirk doesn't seem to care about his friends at all, aside from toying with Jake from time to time, and Jane is so normal and unassuming, you wonder why she's hanging out with a borderline robot, a 15-year-old alcoholic, and a 1920s island dweller, none of whom she's ever met in person. The love triangle also starts with a scene that perfectly encapsulates this chapter. Jake straight up asks Jane if she's into him, and in a panic, she accidentally says no and is too embarrassed to correct herself. This conversation is unbearably long. It takes around six walls of text to get across a point that could have been made clear in two at the most. At the same time, though, we keep seeing reaction images from Jane, and they're absolutely hilarious. And that really sums up this chapter as a whole. It's pretty good when it lets the visuals do the storytelling, but it's unbearable when it keeps hitting you with these walls of text. And sadly, the bad far outweighs the good here. This is the first chapter in Homestuck I can confidently call bad. So, another intermission. Luckily, 6-2-B has a lot more going on than the last one. It starts off with a really strange segment involving Hussey's self-insert. He's shown nursing Spade Slick back to health because Spade somehow managed to survive his entire universe being destroyed, and then we get our first glimpse of Lord English in action. It's just a cold open though, so don't expect him to do anything until later. Next is the meteor, where Karkit has a pretty interesting argument with his future self. I wasn't a big fan of the time travel memory stuff in Act 5, but I think it really works here. It peels back the layers of Karkit's psyche and shows us how tough it is for him to cope with the journey on the meteor and the events of Act 5. My only complaint is that this convo is really long, and while that length is earned to an extent because it's both interesting and catches us up on what's been going on, it still kind of drags a bit. Next, Rose fills everyone in on the difference between the Alpha and Beta sessions of Suburb, and explains that Roxy and Dirk arrived on Earth several hundred years after Jane and Jake, which is cleverly hidden until the end of 6-2-A. Then, we get
get a hilarious fight between Dave and Karkit. I gotta say, these two play really well off of each other. Dave's cool facade and penchant for messing with people mixes with Karkit's irritability and general weirdness for a truly hilarious combo. They just get on each other's nerves in all the right ways. Note, this is not me saying they make a good couple, because that's canon in the epilogues, and it's probably best if I don't get into that here. Back with John and Jade, John has everyone playing the Ghostbusters 2 MMO, which is pretty funny, but it quickly shifts to being a vehicle for John and Jade to discuss their feelings about the adventure. Then, we get introduced to two characters that were foreshadowed in 6 2 a You thought we'd only be meeting the kids' guardians, right? Well, nope. We get to see the Trolls' ancestors from their original session, too. We actually meet all 12 of them, but right now we just get introduced to the important ones. Mina Pikesies and Aranea Circuit. Starting with Mina, she's Feferi's ancestor and the alternate universe version of the Condes. I get what they were trying to do by putting her front and center, but it didn't really work. I'll explain why later. For right now, how's Mina herself? She's alright. She just kind of does whatever she wants, whenever she wants. She likes to feel like a badass, and a lot of her personality revolves around wanting to beat people up and or stab them with her trident. She's not an especially memorable character, but she gets some laughs, and I never really mind when she shows up. As opposed to Aranea. Remember when I said Jake was my least favorite character? Well, is a close second. Honestly, her inclusion almost feels cruel. Act 6 is already way too text-heavy as is, and Aranea's main character trait is telling overly long, boring stories and never knowing when to shut up. It's a shame too, because there are some aspects of her that could be interesting, but her main gimmick is like pounding rusty nails into an already infected wound. She offers to heal Terezi's blindness, and Terezi refuses, which is interesting. Finally, the chapter ends with Hussey rescuing Slick once again before going to fight Lord English and dying. Now that's one hell of a way to build up your main antagonist. Have him literally kill the author. So overall, 6-2-B had some genuinely interesting and funny moments, but a lot of boring stuff too. And even some of the good stuff dragged on longer than it should have. After reading Homestuck for the first time, I actually remembered Act 6 being pretty good, mainly for two reasons. For starters, there's the boiling frog metaphor I mentioned earlier. The problems start off small and grow at a rate so slow you don't notice until it's too late. The other reason is that I remembered a bunch of really good moments from base Act 6. We'll get to what I mean by base act six later. The reason I'm bringing this up now is because with the exception of three of them, one of which doesn't even hold up, all of these awesome moments happened in 6-3-A. This doesn't bode well for act six as a whole, but does mean that 6-3-A is actually pretty good. Probably the best post-cascade chapter. It just goes from one awesome moment to the next, and while some of these segments do drag a bit due to poison number four, it's not as big of a deal here as it is in most of act six. So let's get into these awesome moments. Moment, shall we? The chapter starts off with an interactive flash of Jane exploring her planet on Suburb. Once again, it's a YouTube video, but the world is pretty expansive and atmospheric. There's even a couple puzzles you have to do to progress. Or, you know, you can just go to the next page, where you find Gamzee selling potions made from his dead friend's blood. It's such a weird idea, but it's pretty funny. And then, for some godforsaken reason, Gamzee throws Vriska and Tavros' bodies into Jane's kernel, which fuses the two of them before blowing up due to just how incompatible they are. This triggers both of them to get more involved in the story, but I won't talk about that here since they don't really do anything in this chapter. Also, if you're wondering why Gamzee's here, yeah, I don't know either. This does bring up an issue I have with Gamzee as a whole in Act 6, though. They turn him into a complete joke. Granted, he was goofy before, but in Act 5, he managed to be both funny and downright terrifying at times, and it kind of feels like they just threw that away for the sake of lol funny clown. I think a lot of it's his outfit. His old appearance could make him look like a goofy stoner and a terrifying monster. Here, though, I don't care how violent he he gets. It's impossible to take him seriously in that stupid, fake god-tier outfit. Next, we get a flashback of when Dirk told Jake about how the Earth was turned into a post-apocalyptic hellscape by the Condes. The backstory shows us what the future looks like, tells us what the original four were doing in this time,
timeline and crafts a tense yet funny story about the Condes taking over. It even incorporates real life figures in hilariously creative ways that only Homestuck could. I do think this segment is a bit longer than it needed to be, but only a bit. And the story is so interesting, it's tough to get too mad at it. Next, we get a segment of Jack Noir trying to break out of a Prospitin jail. It's hilarious and the closest we get to old school Homestuck in Act 6. It's got funny narration, a trollish atmosphere, and Jack Noir repeatedly failing to escape from prison in some pretty hilarious ways. We also get a segment of Jake and Aranea talking, which is clearly the weakest part of the chapter, but also not terrible. We actually get some interesting character stuff from Aranea, and they go to meet up with the gang from the Meteor. This leads to Mina shutting down Aranea in an incredibly satisfying and hilarious moment. Oh, and Jake does something stupid, because of course he does. The remaining kids also make it into the game in this chapter. The whole time, there's this elaborate plan executed by Dirk and the autoresponder to get everyone into the game before Dirk and Roxy get killed by the Red Mile. However, things start going wrong about halfway through, and the disaster is cleverly shown through some short character select segments that now let us look at all four characters. And while I do think they made Dirk a bit too perfect overall, I'm not gonna lie, it is pretty cool seeing him fix this major setback in one fell swoop. Toward the end of the chapter, there are two flashes showing Dirk putting his plan into action. So many minor details start working off of each other, like a Rube Goldberg machine of Homestuck logic, and it's really fun to watch. The Flashes also have some pretty hilarious facial expressions and take a break just to focus on Jake, because part of this plan involves Jake being forced to kiss Dirk's severed head. The autoresponder flat out tells Jake what he has to do, and their argument is as psychotic as it is hilarious, culminating in a comically cinematic shot of Jake kissing Dirk. We also learn more about Calliope. Her introduction is pretty clever with the way it reveals major plot points, and in general, her room is really interesting. Callie's actual appearance is cleverly hidden for a good portion of the chapter, and there's a reason for that. She's not human, nor is she a troll. She's a cherub, a species that, among other things, is largely defined by two opposing personalities inhabiting the same body until one of them wins out and kills the other. So yeah, that brother Callie's been talking about is actually her alternate personality, Caliborn. I've waited until now to talk about him because he's the biggest part of this chapter. Technically, he first showed up in 6-2-A, but in the same way Jade showed up in Act 1 or the Trolls showed up in Act 3. I'm just gonna say it, Caliborn is my favorite character in all of Homestuck, and this chapter does a great job of introducing him. The first time we hear from him in this chapter is an interaction with Dirk that might just be the funniest conversation in the whole comic. I dare not spoil what it's about. He initially comes off as an immature, socially incompetent and just play malicious internet troll. Seriously, the kind of stuff he says to the kids is way meaner than any of the trolls. But that seems like the extent of it. Despite the fact he tries to model himself off of Jigsaw, he just seems like a massive but relatively harmless jerk. Yes, he killed Callie's dream self, and that is cause for concern, but dream selves are also kind of expendable, so maybe you can look past that. But as the two of them get closer to playing the game, Callie's warnings get more and more dire, and Caliborn's insults while still hilarious, have a much more sinister undertone. There's literally a character select segment narrated by Caliborn that has him cheering with sadistic glee as he watches the Act 6 kids die. However, it really comes to a peak with the chapter's final flash, which is the first time we see Caliborn's name and his full appearance. In probably the most sinister animation in the comic, not counting Gamzee's Massacre, it becomes clear to us that Caliborn is more than just some asshole online, or even a regular villain. He's Lord English. And this flash also shows why Lord English is such a threat. He's so powerful that he can kill ghosts. Ever since we learned about the dream bubbles, death kind of lost its punch. But seeing Lord English wipe out a bunch of alternate versions of characters we've met brings that fear right back. It also gets made clear that this is harming the fabric of the universe as a whole. As for the Flash itself, it's fine. I thought it was crazy the first time I watched it, but upon a second viewing, the Caliborn stuff is the only part that stands out. The Lord English half is terrifying when you don't know about his death laser, but once you do, he's just kinda there. Overall, 6-3 was pretty good. It had a few slow moments and some of Act 6 is poison, but it's still a good time. Now that we've gotten this far in Act 6, there's something you might have noticed. 
noticed. There haven't been any Alternia Bound segments. What happened? It seemed like they finally found their groove with the interactive stuff, yet we haven't seen them since Act 5. Well, they're still here, they're just condensed into the open bound segments of 6-3-B. These segments actually take up the majority of the chapter, so it makes sense to talk about them first. There's three open bound segments, and all of them focus on Mina as she journeys through the dream bubbles to try and recruit an army to fight Lord English. Along the way, she meets up with all the trolls from her session, and through both the dialogue and Aranea's narration, we learn about each of the remaining ancestors. Relax, I'm not gonna give them bios. Latula and Curlaz are the only ones who have any impact on the story, and even then, their impact is minuscule. They're all pretty one-note characters, and most of them are just jokes. Terezi's ancestor has no sense of smell, Solux's has an even worse text quirk than his, Karkit's is an SJW, you get the picture. I don't think this is a problem, though, because these aren't really meant to be a new batch of characters. They're just here to answer the obvious question, what were the other ten ancestors like? In addition to the ancestors, you also run into the Meteor crew and get updates on what they're going through. And that's about it, story-wise. These segments have all the same trappings of the other Alternia Bound flashes, with the dialogue, items, and character changes. There are only two major differences. The first one is that this was programmed in HTML5, meaning unlike the others, it's actually still playable. The other difference is the length. Assuming you're trying to see all of the dialogue, these segments are about an hour each. And since it's a game, you're kind of expected to do it all in one sitting, even if you don't technically have to. Now, this isn't too bad, as you can skip these segments segments entirely and lose basically nothing other than the knowledge of who these funny background characters are, but it brings me to a much bigger problem. These are the only Alternia Bound segments in all of Act 6, and while these segments themselves are impressive and very ambitious, I don't think it's a good trade-off. Maybe they couldn't find a place to put them, but I would have preferred shorter Alternia Bound segments sprinkled throughout Act 6 instead of these three insanely long ones right in the middle. Especially since the ones in Act 5 move the plot forward in meaningful ways, while these are just filler. Creative filler that answers a question just about everyone had, but filler nonetheless. Now, what about the rest of 6-3-B? What happens in between these segments? Well, John watches Con Air with Jade and hates it, which is a comedic but mostly kind of sad moment that shows how much the journey is getting to John. It's well executed, but not exactly fun to watch. He also gets into a short fight with Beck Noir. This is the most Beck Noir does in basically all of Act 6. Gotta love the fact this guy was a gigantic threat in Act 5, and now he's an afterthought. Not a huge complaint, just an observation. As for the other stuff, the Meteor Gang does some boring stuff, Vriska and Tavros do some boring stuff that I want to wait to talk about, and Mina and Vriska get into a pretty hilarious fight. So in the end, 6-3-B basically hinges entirely on open bound, which is good, but also really long and kinda pointless. The rest of the chapter is mostly boring, with the occasional interesting moment. 6-4-A starts with a flash that gives us a montage of what the Act 6 gang has been up to now that they've entered the game. It also ends with that flash. Yes, this chapter is just one flash. The flash itself is alright, but not particularly interesting. It's essentially a troll move, but considering what comes next, I'm not even angry. 6-4-B opens on an ominous note, and it's quickly revealed in a pretty awesome fashion that this entire intermission centers around Caliborn. It starts by showing him walking through the barren wasteland that is his session. This part is kinda boring, at least until he runs into Gamzy, and then this radio tower thing. The tower allows Caliborn to see into the Alpha session, and more importantly, it lets him talk directly with Hussey. The bulk of this chapter is just these two going back and forth with the occasional interruption from Gamzy. And despite my constant complaints about Act 6 being too text heavy, I think it really works here. Caliborn is so entertaining that he can make characters like Dirk and Callie interesting, but pairing him up with Hussey is just too perfect. They play incredibly well off of each other, making 6-4-B the only real competition 6-3-A has as the best post-Cascade chapter. Since this chapter is all about Caliborn, I think I should take this time to explain why he's my favorite character. The best way to describe Caliborn's personality is that he's a 
combination of Eric Cartman and Invader Zit. He's a petulant child as well as an eccentric narcissist. He always feels the need to put a flair of showmanship on all of his evil schemes, and some schemes that aren't even his. He's not just singularly focused on causing mayhem either. He fancies himself an artist despite being absolutely terrible at it, which makes for some good laughs. That's not his only weakness either. It gets mentioned that he has a learning disability, and in general, he clearly doesn't know how to interact with people. However, despite being a brat who's comically bad at most everyday things, Caliborn's no slouch in the villain department. He makes some pretty smart moves as his story progresses and can be disturbingly malicious. The reason he and Hussey work so well off each other is that they get under each other's skin in all the best ways. Hussey's rightfully horrified by how much of an ass Caliborn is, but expresses it in a goofy way, while Caliborn is quick to get fed up with Hussey's cryptic hints and just starts yelling at him. Couple that with some hilarious interruptions from Gamzee, and you've got a really funny chapter on your hands that actually manages to make drawn out exposition entertaining. So far, Act 6 hasn't been so bad. Aside from 6-2, every chapter has ranged from mediocre to actually kinda good. That all changes here. 6-5 is when the rot really starts to set in. The chapter opens with a pretty meh flash, and then we get what I'm sure you all want to see from Homestuck, poorly written teen romance. Basically, Jake has managed to make both Jane and Dirk miserable through his sheer social incompetence. Jane freaks out on him, which is pretty satisfying, but is it worth the pages upon pages of Jake's insufferable rambling? She runs off in a pretty hilarious gif and somehow managed to simultaneously get fat shamed and objectified by Calibor. We get a segment with Droog, who's taken over Jack's post with him being in jail and all. The jokes here are clever, but so drawn out, they're not really funny. Intermission 1 had some long pages too, but they were in service of all the crazy things that were happening. Here, it feels like Droog's inner monologue is long just for the sake of of being long. Next, we get Roxy traveling through dream bubbles, which is nice. The visuals are creative, and hearing Roxy yammer to herself is decently entertaining. That is until she meets up with Callie, who proceeds to give a long-winded explanation of what Lord English is up to. This is a perfect example of why I don't like Calliope. Whenever it seems like we're going to get more personality from her, she just turns into a long-winded exposition machine. Next, we get a sadly botched conversation between Dirk and his autoresponder. This is the first time we actually see Dirk have some insecurities. He mentions that he hates the autoresponder since it's a copy of his personality from when he was 13, so it just reminds him of how much of an ass he used to be and to an extent still is. This conversation fails for several reasons. The main one is length. I know I've been complaining about Poison Number 4 for a while now, but there is a damn good reason for that. It's still a problem. Act 6 seems to have this mentality that if you just write more words, more emotions will come with them. And you'll seem smarter because look, more words. The fact of the matter though is that less is often more. So much of this dialogue could be cut and nothing would change because these points can be gotten across in a much more concise way. It doesn't need to be super brief. Act 5 had a good amount of text and it got its points across just fine, but that's because it kept a balance. Whenever I look at dialogue like this, my eyes just glaze over because staring at a wall of text is exhausting and I feel like my time is being wasted. Also, last Last I checked, Homestuck is a comic. It's a visual medium. You can use the pictures to take stress away from the text. The other issue with this scene is that I don't believe Dirk. A lot of the things used to explain away his behavior make no sense. He remarks that the autoresponder goes behind his back and makes decisions without his permission, but the examples used were events Dirk had to be a part of. He talks about how AR put the battle bot on hard mode, but Dirk is the one who sent it to Jake in the first place, knowing it would be a nightmare for him. The same is true with Jake kissing Dirk's severed head. Sure, AR chose to do a creepy HAL 9000 impression, but it's not like he made Dirk decapitate himself and send his head to Jake. Dirk was the only one who could do that, and he chose to make Jake kissing his head a crucial part of his master plan. The funny part is, this scene does end on an emotional note, with the autoresponder begging for its life. Once again, I feel nothing for Dirk, but I do feel bad for this AI clone of him that's supposed to be less likable.
In the end, Dirk throws the glasses into a kernel that already has Equius in it to create Arqueus, who's actually a pretty good character. I don't think he's worthy of a bio, but he's pretty damn funny. That reminds me, the other dead trolls are here too in the form of fused sprites. Solux and Aridin form Aerosol, while Fefri and Nepita form Fefita. Because clearly the best move to give these characters more development is to have them fused with someone else. Neither of them are interesting either. Aerosol just goes on about how he hates everything, and Fafita barely speaks. We see Caliborn talk with Jake, and Jake is so bad he manages to make Caliborn boring. We also learn that Caliborn now has Cal, remember him? And possibly used the puppet to brainwash Gamzee in his session, which is part of what made him go crazy. I think. Like I said, there were a lot of factors involved with that, and it's not super clear. We then see Jane in her house, moping around. There are a bunch of jokes that try to mimic the early act stuff with John, but once again, they're too wordy to land. Jane then alchemizes a couple of lollipops, which leads to my biggest disappointment rereading Homestuck, trickster mode. It's this super weird and goofy drug trip where Jane goes around turning her friends into these deliriously happy weirdos who try to work through their problems in the dumbest way imaginable. When I first read this part, I thought it was hilarious, but reading it again, it doesn't really hold up. Admittedly, I think the lack of porting the games over is a big factor here. When I first read this part, I thought it was hilarious, but reading it again, it doesn't really hold up. There were so many small games that really got you in the spirit of this oddly fast-paced segment. Now they've been reduced to YouTube videos, so they lost a lot of their magic. I don't know if that's the full reason, or if my sense of humor has changed, or what, but this segment really isn't that funny to me anymore. Also, they somehow managed to screw up alchemization. The early alchemization segments were fun because they just took whatever the character had lying around and combined them in creative, unexpected ways. Here, they just keep making different kinds of zilly weapons, and while the names are kind of funny, the joke is incredibly predictable and gets old fast. Afterward, Hussey and Caliborn argue for a bit, and then the screen expands to show us two panels at once, which makes for some cool visuals and double the dialogue. This part really is insufferable. The dialogue is just as overwritten as ever, and it doesn't even resemble anything interesting this time. It's just the fallout from trickster mode and the love triangle. Gotta love how these four are so unconvincing as friends that you have to resort to petty teen drama to make them interesting, which, spoiler alert, doesn't work. I don't care about this stupid romance subplot. I don't even like any of the people involved. And it just keeps going on and on, while some much more interesting stuff happens with the visuals. Caliborn mind controls Jack into becoming a servant, which looks really cool, even if this character does basically nothing after this chapter. He's about to attack, but Jade shows up to save the day. Then the Condess mind controls her, has her mind control Jane, teleport Dirk far away, and capture Roxy and Jake. Okay, as negative as I've been, I have to admit, that's a pretty good cliffhanger. Overall, this chapter was awful, but in a weird way. Most of its ideas were good, like a segment with Droog or Jane's meltdown having callbacks to John, but they were executed horribly, mainly because every conversation feels like it's five times longer than it needs to be. So after how bad 65A was, is 65B any better? No. This chapter has three major plot lines in it. The stuff on the meteor, the stuff John's up to, and the occasional intermission to check in on Caliborn. Yes, whenever it switches to Caliborn, it turns into an intermission intermission. I can't decide if this is funny or obnoxious. Maybe a bit of both. The labels, not the intermissions themselves. The Caliborn segments are the one good part of this chapter. His interactions with Hussey are just as funny as they were in 6-4-B, only this time, stuff's actually happening. His plot line has us follow him on his journey through his session of Suburb, which is wildly different from the others since it's not meant to be a single player game. We get to see the origin of the felt here and how they tie into everything, and it's pretty funny watching Hussey try not to reference Intermission 1. It's also nice seeing Caliborn go through his own personal journey, which ends kind of tragically, with him clearly missing having Hussey to talk to, losing the closest thing to a friend he had. Also, just in general, we see him go on more of a journey than any of the Act 6 crew, which is kind of a problem. Next is the Meteor. Both Rose and Terezi are seriously out of commission. Rose has become an alcoholic, and Terezi's self-worth has been so utterly destroyed by Gamzee that she actually had Aranea restore her eyesight. Speaking of which, remember back in the troll romance section when I said I'd go over my problems with the Spades couples later? Well, now seems like the perfect time. It's made clear that Gamzee and Terezi are in a kiss nemesis tude, and over the course of the relationship, Gamzee treated her like 
giant garbage. He eroded her self-worth so thoroughly that she gave up her way of seeing the world, which was something she took great pride in and was a huge chunk of who she was. Now, this clearly sounds like an abusive relationship, but given everything we've seen about Spades couples, is it really that out of the ordinary? After all, the two most prominent Spades couples we've seen in the story are Vriska and Tavros and Jack and the Black Queen. Both couples are incredibly hostile and end with one partner killing the other. So are Kiss Nemesis Toons just abusive relationships? Is it considered normal for trolls to abuse their partners in certain relationship configurations? Is the snowman stabbing spades in the eye a normal courting gesture? That would be really screwed up if it were the case, especially since, unlike the Hema Spectrum, it's never treated as a barbaric institution. It's treated like it's perfectly normal. Luckily, I don't think that's what they were going for. I think Kiss Nemesis Toons are sort of like romantic rivalries. Like, you still care about the person, but instead of showing your love with kind words and acts of romance, you do it with insults and acts of trolling. At least, that's my interpretation. And that's the big problem here. This major part of troll culture is so horribly explained that I need to read between the lines in order to figure out what it means and avoid the worst possible interpretation. So, Karkin is trying to get Terezi back on her feet, and while the drama with Terezi is good, and Karkin and Dave do have some funny back and forths, it's still pretty damn text heavy. It's especially not helped by the fact that every pre-Cascade character other than John and Vriska has had virtually nothing to do for the entirety of Act 6, so another feelings jam is kind of exhausting because that's all these guys have been doing since Cascade. I also can't say I'm a fan of what Act 6 did to Terezi. I'll admit she got off easier than most of the other characters as the drama involving her is good and she does have some pretty badass moments later on, but she's also way too serious. She was such a funny character in Act 5, but now that entire part of her personality is gone. Yeah, she's in a rough spot emotionally, but so is Karkin, and he still has some hilarious exchanges with Dave. What I'm getting at is that her serious side is cool, but it's the only side to her now, when in Act 5 it was balanced with all the comedic stuff. And I'm sorry, but I really miss funny Terezi. Rose and Kanaya also go through some relationship drama, which isn't particularly interesting, although Drunk Rose is pretty funny. The main reason I'm bringing it up, though, is because of what Act 6 did to these two. I feel like both of their characters got watered down as the story went on. With Kanaya, I feel like her personality gets reduced to just being Rose's girlfriend with the occasional reference to troll culture. As for Rose, she lost her snark. In the early chapters, she was really witty and sarcastic, which made her a really funny character. That faded away a bit in Act 5, but it was in service of a pretty good arc. Now, though, that attitude is completely gone on, and she just feels like an overly verbose intellectual. Like, she can be kind of witty, but not in nearly as fun of a way as before. Finally, we have John's plotline, which is easily the worst of the three. Before getting into the actual events, though, I have to talk about the way Vriska and Tavros were handled. Starting with Tavros, it's like his arc in Act 5 didn't exist. He spends 5-2 learning to stand up for himself, which culminates in him trying to kill Vriska. And now, he's more subservient to her than he ever was, to the point where he tries to wrestle a ring away from John so he can use it to propose to her. Yeah, at the end of the chapter he flies away, leaving Vriska behind, signaling that he's learned his lesson, but he already learned his lesson. Why did he need to learn it again? And now, we get to Vriska. Out of all the characters Act 6 butchered, Vriska is easily the worst. Remember in Act 5 where Vriska was learning to become a more mature, humble, and empathetic person? Well, in Act 6, she's basically back to square one. She has the same personality as in early Act 5, only now, instead of getting into trouble because of problems she created, she's seen as a great leader in the fight against Lord English. She's less sadistic than before, but just as arrogant, and now her arrogance is completely vindicated, making her an even bigger Mary Sue than Dirk. I will admit, it's not out of the question for Vriska to go back to her old personality, logically speaking, since all of her development only took place over the course of a day, but it's not good storytelling. A lot of people got invested in her arc in 5-2, and now that most of that development has disappeared, it feels like we're being cheated out of an interesting evolution of her character. The only thing that's really changed about her is that she apologized to Tavros for killing him. And even then, it's not shown as any deep regret, just a casual, yeah, I screwed up, but I'm still 
still gonna treat you like garbage. I will admit she does give a good speech about not needing to be a good person to be a hero toward the end, but it feels out of nowhere compared to the rest of her behavior in Act 6. However, Vriska isn't even the worst part of this plot line. That would be Aranea. Aranea spends the entire chapter telling boring, long-winded stories, pumping out more exposition than Calliope could ever dream of. I should also point out that the comic acknowledges the fact Aranea's stories are boring, yet we're still forced to listen to them. As for what these stories are, there's essentially three. The first is explaining cherub biology and reproduction, as well as Caliborn's backstory. The thing is, we already have a good understanding of how cherubs work, so we only really need a few pages to fill in the blanks. Instead, we get pages upon pages of explanation about mating rituals and genetics, and so many other facts that are completely irrelevant to the story. Same with Caliborn's backstory. We see a long spiel about his parents, when in reality, all we need to know is that Gamzee raised the Cal twins and gave them their copy of Suburb. And even that doesn't need to be explained here. It would probably be better if it was just implied, given all the other stuff about Gamzee that's shrouded in mystery. The second story is about the rules of Caliborn's Suburb session, which are helpful to know, but I'm just left thinking how much cooler it would have been to see this stuff from Caliborn and Hussey's perspective. Finally, she talks about the Ring of Life and the Ring of Void. I hate these freaking things. They're basically pointless, aside from giving Callie an obligatory happy ending. They write the story into a corner later on that requires some serious bullshit to get them out of, and they're another complex magical artifact in a story that already had way too many overly complicated rules. This plotline doesn't really go anywhere, aside from the boring stories. We learn that Arati is a psychopath, which isn't that surprising, and John touches an artifact that causes him to start teleporting all over the place, ending with an admittedly funny flash. Also, in order to spite Vriska, it's a long story, Hussey cuts away from the John plot to focus on Spade Slick. He meets up with the Felt again, and this plot suffers the same fate as Droog in the last chapter. It's so text-heavy, it's boring. Way to go! You made the Midnight Crew segment suck! I hope you're happy! Now, while this chapter does have some redeeming factors, like the Caliborn segments, a couple funny moments on the meteor, and a nice visual recap of the story when John touches the artifact, this chapter is the worst yet for one major reason. Both times I read through Homestuck, I had this same reaction at roughly the same exact time. It was in the John plotline. I believe when they're in the jungle. That's when I said to myself, okay, I'm done. I'm ready for the story to be over now. Please, just end already. How much longer until the finale? And if you've got me begging for this comic I used to love to end, that's a bad sign. Act 6-6 is weirdly meta. It lets you know right off the bat Caliborn's taken over the comic with a background change in everything. After a comically bad piano solo he won't let you skip, we're treated to homo suck. Caliborn's rendition of Homestuck with his narration and endearingly bad artwork. Now, as awesome as this premise sounds, it actually kinda sucks. Caliborn is great, but he needs someone or something to work off of, and most of the chapter is just him spewing narration at you. I know it's supposed to be self-parody, but these observations about the early acts aren't clever in the slightest, which I guess makes sense for Caliborn, but doesn't make for a pleasant reading experience. The one moment I did like was his reaction to the manga drawing book, because like I said earlier, it gives him something to work off of, so it winds up being funny. Afterward, he finds the cartridge for Act 6, Act 6, and shoves special stardust in it, which I'm sure won't have any major consequences, and then we learn how Act 6, Act 6 is structured. Since Caliborn's in control now, his segments will be the main acts, while the rest of the story is the intermissions. Yeah, that's right, Act 6, Act 6 is also split up into six smaller acts. Gotta love that structure. Act 6, 6, 1B starts off really promising for exactly 80 seconds. It starts with this awesome flash that shows off the meteor's arrival in a similar style to Cascade. Only they're able to capture the feel better here since it shows the whole web page. It doesn't last long though because the flash glitches out at the 1 minute 20 second mark and we're left with this mess. Right off the bat, we've got my biggest issue with Stardust. The glitches. I was fine with things glitching out in 5-2 because it gave us the scratch segment, and more importantly, it only lasted a couple of pages. Here, the glitches are present throughout this entire chapter and a little bit in 
in future chapters. So for a large portion of Stardust, the art is ruined by this incredibly ugly glitch effect. Not to mention certain features simply not working. The absolute worst part is the character select screens. There are a bunch of times in this chapter where there's a character select screen, but it's so glitched out you can only select one of the options. It's meant as a quirky little running joke, but it just gets infuriating. It's essentially saying, look at this cool feature we introduced in early act six. Now we're gonna rip it away from you. Why? To complement an ugly aesthetic? These glitches contribute nothing to the plot other than pissing off the reader and maybe creating a mystery at the beginning of the chapter? Even then, it's not that much of a mystery and certainly not worth all the bullshit that comes with it. While we're on the subject of the art, I wanna talk about poison number three. Act six, act six is when you start to realize just how much of Homestuck's identity was lost along the way. Almost nothing from the early acts remains. The narration is basically non-existent aside from the stupid character select screens, the base sprites are only used as placeholders for when the characters are just chatting, and the commands don't exist anymore aside from very rare exceptions. These things were all a huge part of the comic's original identity and charm. Seeing them gone just feels wrong. You could argue this is so they could tell a darker, more serious, and more intense story, but Gamzee's Rampage, Grimdark Rose, and Vriska's final chat message were all darker, more serious, and more intense than anything in 6-6, yet Act 5 was still able to keep the same silliness from the early acts. Yeah, it was to a lesser degree, but it was still a big part of the chapter. Removing these elements entirely not only strips away a large chunk of what made Homestuck Homestuck, but it also makes things a lot less fun. There are still jokes, but it's like the comic forgot how to be itself. Anyway, what actually happens in this chapter? Well, John's warping around uncontrollably while the J girls have taken everyone else hostage and are forcing them to enact the Condess's plan to kill Lord English and establish a new universe she can rule over. This is probably a good time to talk about my big problem with the Condess. Aside from Lord English, she's the biggest villain of Act 6. She's been hinted at since Act 5, she plays a big role in the Act 6 gang's lives, and her fingerprints are all over the Alpha Session. They try to shroud her in mystery, but since she's not the main villain, that doesn't really do much to add to her intimidation factor, it just results in her being underdeveloped. Now, I get what they were going for with her development. They showed off her personality through Mina the same way they showed off Lord English with Caliborn. There's a pretty big difference between these examples though. Caliborn is Lord English. He goes on to become the screaming skeleton man we all know and fear, and we see every major step in his journey, just out of order. Mina is the Condess from an alternate universe, a very very different alternate universe where Alternia coddled the weak instead of exterminating them. She also died as a teenager. The Condess served as the empress of an intergalactic empire for thousands if not millions of years before being taken down a peg by Doc Scratch and forced to play second fiddle to Lord English. She manipulated the events on both versions of Earth to make sure Suburb got played by the right people, then infiltrated and took over the Alpha Session in an attempt to get out from under English and used the game to create a new empire for her to rule. That's an incredibly interesting story, but we don't get to see most of it or how she feels about it because we were too busy watching her ghetto clone play pirates with Vriska in a walking Wikipedia article. As for the rest of the chapter, it's just 6-5 with glitches. There's a funny segment where Jane resells the troll blood to Kanaya at a huge markup and she can't resist because Rainbow Drinker and Jane trying to be a villain is actually pretty funny given how sweet she usually is, but those moments are surrounded by and drenched in excessive text and that stupid glitch filter. 662A starts off basically the same as 661A. Caliborn's still doing his weird fanfic, but John winds up teleporting into it. We get to see John interact with Caliborn's horrible drawings and fight back against his terrible storytelling. I wouldn't quite call this segment funny, but it is creative, which puts it leagues ahead of the first one. 662B is a freaking miracle. Why? After three long chapters of of text overload, stuff actually starts happening again. And oddly enough, it's because of my two least favorite characters in the comic. Basically, Aranea mind controls Gamzee to steal the Ring of Life so she can revive herself. She then proceeds to unlock Jake's full potential, which causes him to erupt in this giant hope force field and causes his old-timey dialogue to actually be funny for once. What follows is an increasingly crazy series of events that manages to rope in most of the cast and even kill some of them. While there's the occasional moment of poison number four, the visuals do the storytelling for the most part. Now, I'm not saying the events that happen 
happened here are well thought out or even good for the story. In fact, they write it into a serious corner. But you know what? At least it's something. At least it's actually fun to watch, unlike the last three major chapters. 663A decides to mix things up a bit. Instead of trying to recreate Homestuck, Caliborn now has a DeviantArt, and his skills have improved. Yeah, this is an improvement. The entire chapter is a jab at bad DeviantArt accounts, and while the digs they make are clever, they aren't particularly funny. Maybe it's because I've heard these kinds of jokes plenty of times before, or maybe it's because trashing DeviantArt isn't as relevant as it used to be, but this segment feels weirdly dated to me. Still better than the first Homo Sucks segment, though. Plus, there were a few jokes that got a chuckle out of me, like Caliborn's names for the trolls and giving himself a fedora. Anyway, John teleports into the room, realizes Cal Caliborn is Lord English and is about to beat him up when the comic transitions to the next chapter. Like a couple other chapters at this point, 663B is just one flash. Game over. I probably have more mixed feelings on this flash than any other moment in the comic. On one hand, it's freaking stupid. It's the emptiest threat imaginable. Every major character other than John, Roxy, and Terezi winds up dead at the end of it, and Terezi's in pretty bad shape. Oh yeah, I'm sure they're all gonna stay dead, just like I was sure everyone would stay dead in Kingdom Hearts 3. This comic that has shown us no less than five methods of resurrection isn't gonna find a way to weasel out of killing off most of the cast. Not only is it incredibly toothless, but it also forces the comic to make an incredibly stupid move, but we'll get to that when we get to that. On the other hand, this flash is so cool. The music and animation are both superb, and the action is arguably the best in the entire comic. It manages to bring all the insane, disparate events of 662B into an intense climax in a way only beaten by Cascade. It also messes with the webpage in more creative ways than anything else in the comic. Cascade is still my favorite Flash for obvious reasons, but this is an easy second place. Game Over may be terrible for the story as a whole, but it's really good as a standalone moment. Coming in hot after Game Over, The Dark Knight of the Feelings manages to do something fantastic as well. Unlike the other 66 Caliborn segments, this one's actually funny. At first I couldn't tell why, but after thinking about it, it made sense. It's funny because he's actually reacting to something. Sure, he's not interacting with anyone directly, but he's reacting to John beating him up by playing victim in the most hilarious way possible. This chapter's actually shorter than the others, but I'm fine with that. It just means the joke can't overstay its welcome. 664B is really unusual for Homestuck. The entire chapter feels like a slow, quiet moment. Not uneventful like so many of the intermissions, just slow for reasons that actually feel earned. Basically, John meets with Terezi to come up with a plan to undo everything that just happened, but it doesn't work. So, after a tragic moment of Rose dying right in front of her, Roxy goes with John to his planet to give her a proper funeral. Meanwhile, John completes his planet's quest, which results in some clever visuals and callbacks with him spreading the oil all over the timeline. I'm not sure if all of these pictures originally had the oil in them, but I know that some did. Anyway, this gives John the power he needs to execute Terezi's plan. You see, John's new power allows him to travel back in time, but unlike Dave, he can actually change things. Retcon events, if you will. No, seriously, that's actually what they call this power. The retcon. Specifically, Terezi has John go back in time to make a couple important changes to the past. With each change, it literally takes you back to an earlier page where you have a different option that lets you put in a code Terezi wrote and make the change. This makes it easy to check how the events originally played out in case you forgot. Also, if you started reading after the comic was finished, it answers the mystery of the weird Terezi pages in a satisfying way. While this romp down memory lane was fun, the retcon is still a terrible idea. Yeah, Homestuck already had way too many ways to come back from the dead, but each of them had hard limits. The retcon essentially means that if John's still alive, everyone's golden. They could screw up as many times as they need to, and he could just undo it. The way the retcon was used here also has some issues, but I'll get to that a bit later. This chapter also has a side plot where the J girls go meet with Callie inside of her little dream bubble. They all create trollsonas for themselves, and Jade explains what happened in the new timeline John created while Callie illustrates the story. It's nice seeing her art style, and the plot does a good job of withholding certain pieces of information from you to make certain reveals hit harder. It's also just a generally cute plot line, and Callie actually has a personality for once. This is the one time in the story where I genuinely cared what happened to her. We also get this 
this weirdly wholesome romance between Mina and Vriska. It's nice to see Vriska mellow out, as we were kind of robbed of that earlier. So, here's the weird thing about this chapter. All of the plot lines were well done, and Poison Number 4 wasn't especially potent, but this chapter still left a bad taste in my mouth. Sure, it made an obviously terrible plot choice, but so did the last two, and I enjoyed them. I think the reason I can enjoy this chapter isn't because of the chapter itself. You see, this chapter's a lot like the Doc Scratch segment in 5-2. While that one was much more unique, it was also a slow, quiet moment that was probably around the same length as this chapter. The big difference is that segment has the epic crescendo that is Cascade after it. When I'm rereading this chapter, I already know what comes after, and it makes this already sad chapter so, so much sadder. The fifth and final homo suck segment is really different from the others, as it actually has some plot significance. Basically, Caliborn has seen the future and knows how things will play out when he fights the kids, and he illustrates these events using his claymation. The claymation itself is really funny, and while Caliborn's narrations mostly aren't, there are a couple funny lines in there. It shows a pretty grim future for the original four, a clever explanation of why Caliborn took the title Lord English, and Caliborn and Arqueus get Get sucked into Cal. This is followed by a flash that shows the insanely long and convoluted journey this one puppet went on throughout the comic. The Flash has a lot of Illuminati confirmed jokes in it, and it's absolutely warranted given just how brilliant this twist is. Lil Cal showing up everywhere wasn't just a coincidence or a running gag. Caliborn was inside it, watching everything, likely manipulating where it went, corrupting Gamzee and possibly Jack too, getting prototyped into Scratch so he could be reborn as Lord English, and sending the puppet to a different Jack so he could possess him. Caliborn may act like a petulant child, but he's an evil genius. Yes. So, I bet you're wondering what changes Tereziad John make. Well, there's only one that really mattered, and that's knocking Vriska out before she could fight Jack so Terezi wouldn't kill her. She's Back opens with a montage of the events on the meteor in this new timeline now that Vriska's here. The artwork is pretty good, but what it depicts seems kind of ridiculous. This montage makes Vriska out to be this super happy, caring person, and maybe I could buy that if this came immediately after Act 5, but after seeing everything she's done in Act 6, both in the other timeline and after this montage, this doesn't feel like stuff she'd do at all. Maybe that's the point, and Vriska's curating these photos specifically to make herself look good, but it doesn't really show any indication she's lying. Also, this montage shows us two colossal issues with the retcon. For starters, it nullifies everything in Act 6 that happened on the meteor. So all that time we spent with these characters, listening to them talk about their feelings in excruciating detail was utterly wasted because that stuff didn't happen anymore and their situation is completely different now. Second, giving John this much power actually creates plot holes. When you think about it, it was a real dick move on Terezi's part to have John go back and save Vriska but not her other friends on the meteor. Sure, she didn't know the exact circumstances of their deaths but I'm sure she could have sent John to the meteor and had him wait a while. He could retry as many times as he needed to in order to stop the murders. Hell, he could create a paradox army just like Aradia. Also, wouldn't John want to go back and stop his dad from dying? Yeah, he doesn't know when it happened, but he has an idea and knows the exact location. Hell, why stop there? He could just stop Beck from prototyping with the Colonel, keeping Jack from becoming unstoppable, thus making it so the scratch doesn't happen and Jack never forces the trolls into the meteor so they become the gods of John's world. You see why including something this OP is a bad idea? There's nothing stopping John from snapping Caliborn's neck as a baby and completely destroying the time loop. Anyway, after the opening flash, the gang meets on a platform, and I gotta say, they did it! They hit rock bottom! Chapters like the Six Fives and Stardust were really bad, but this is a whole new level. What happens in this chapter? Well, Vriska goes over a game plan for the big showdown. They've got a lot of enemies to deal with. The Condess hasn't been taken care of, the Becks are on their way, Lord Jack is almost back, and even Spade Slick is joining the party. Notice how I didn't bring up Lord English. That's because this team isn't fighting him. Instead, Vriska's going to fight him with an army of Paradox clones assembled by Tavros. By the way, Tavros getting this army together and rubbing it in Vriska's face is pretty much the only satisfying end to a character arc we see here. This also brings me to my biggest problem with Lord English. He's all set up and no payoff. Caliborn has all the ingredients to be 
be one of my favorite villains of all time. Everything from his funny side to his sinister side to the depth we see from his journey to all the brilliant twists involved. The problem is he's never taken down in a satisfying way. Not saying every villain needs that, but Caliborn really does. We don't get to see the initial fight with Caliborn outside of his claymation, and the final showdown with Lord English is pushed to the side. He's fought by the freaking D team and gets killed off screen. Imagine if in Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, Father was ultimately taken down by Major Armstrong in a fight you only see bits and pieces of. Or, you know, if Ant-Man actually went up Thanos' butthole. The only fight with this guy from an emotional standpoint was his brawl with John, and that fight's mostly a joke. Honestly, if it weren't for this one issue, Caliborn might be up there with Monokuma as one of my favorite villains of all time. As it stands, he's still pretty damn good, but man is that anticlimactic. It's not like the other matchups are meaningful either. The power scaling really wrote this finale into a corner. I guess they can't get too mad at the matchups. They're about as emotionally satisfying as they can be while still making sense considering the character's abilities. But that's not saying much. Anyway, back to the chapter itself. Once the planning is done, the rest of the chapter is just characters talking with each other and preparing for battle. Unlike Cascade though, the characters don't have unique responsibilities that are shrouded in mystery. It's just, oh, I'm gonna prepare to fight this guy so they really just spend their time talking with each other. I should probably mention that this is the longest chapter in Homestuck aside from 5-2. Yes, this chapter that consists of basically nothing but characters talking to each other and waiting for a battle is longer than every chapter except the one that had so much going on I had to give it its own video. If that doesn't perfectly illustrate why this chapter is absolute hell, nothing will. Granted, 5-2 is still way longer, but my point still stands. Especially since talking about their feelings is basically all most of these characters have done since 5-2 ended. There are a few moments here I want to talk about, though. Through a complex series of shenanigans, Game Over Rose fuses with Jasper Sprite to become Jaspros, because introducing a new character this late in the game is a perfectly reasonable and not at all insane thing to do. And then Jaspros accidentally fuses Dave Sprite with Nepita to create Dave Pita, who's actually pretty interesting, but the dialogue is far too long for me to get invested in them, and once again, Again, they're introduced right before the end of the comic. Dave and Dirk have a talk about how Dave still has childhood trauma from Bro, and this actually sparks an interesting debate. Can Bro be considered abusive? Yeah, he constantly set traps for Dave and beat the crap out of him in a sword duel on the roof, but those were in Acts 2 and 3. Remember, the first three acts were much more goofy and exaggerated than the rest of the comic. I mean, John attacked his dad with a hammer, Rose threatened to commit suicide in front of her mother, and Jade stuffed her grandpa Pa's body taxidermy style. Are we supposed to take these things seriously now? Because that puts all of the original four in a really different light. Now, you could argue Dave had it worse than the others, which is true, but it seemed like more of an exaggeration of brothers messing with each other. Honestly, this issue really is a Rorjak test, and I fall on the not abusive side. Bro giving Dave his copies of Suburb after their duel is what swayed me. Despite what the worst interpretations say, Bro clearly cared about Dave. The conversation between Dave and Dirk does have some good moments, but once again, it's far too long for me to care. Vriska meets up with her nicer counterpart from the previous timeline and berates her for being happy and nice to people instead of an edgy, war-torn psychopath like she is. Great to know all of Vriska's conversations with John didn't mean shit. Also, the reason the J-Girls aren't causing problems is because Vriska put them to sleep until they can get rid of the mind control. They break the tiara midway through, but Jade has to stay sleeping until the big fight starts. Gotta love how side line Jade gets in Act 6. Between Cascade and Collide, she does nothing of substance of her own free will aside from teleport Lord Jack away. First, she's stuck on the boat with nothing to do but talk to John. And not only are these moments always from John's perspective, but he's not even on the ship half the time. Then, she gets mind controlled, and then she's asleep. Fix This is the only chapter where it feels like she does anything. I know this was necessary because of how OP she is now, but that's why she shouldn't have been given first guardian powers in the first place. We also get a flash of game over Terezi and nice Vriska reuniting in paradox space. It's got great art and is really sweet if you ignore all the 
the stuff Vriska's done over the course of the comic. Seriously, under any objective lens, Vriz Rezi is a horribly abusive pairing. These two should not be together. Toward the end of the chapter, it finally shows mercy and just shows a series of images of the crew gearing up for battle. Everyone's ready to collide, if you will. All right, so here we are at Collide, the big epic finale of Homestuck. Does it live up to the greatness that was Cascade? Not even close. Like I said, a part of this is because the setup isn't nearly as good. Cascade had a couple big reveals and every character doing something drastically different and interesting, while this is just a bunch of people fighting with each other. There aren't a bunch of plot threads being tied up because she's backhammered every plot point other than let's fight these guys into oblivion. Enough comparing it to Cascade though, at least for now. How's Collide on its own? Well, it starts off promising enough with these renditions of the different battlefields right before the fights start. Much like all the other detailed art in this flash, it keeps a consistent style and looks really good. The problems come in once the fighting starts. While there's the occasional detailed image, these fights mostly use the base sprites. Look, I know I complained about the base sprites getting shafted in later chapters, but this is the worst possible time to bring them back. This is the big final battle. It should look cinematic. Instead, most of these fights just look like bosses in a beat-em-up game. While the animation in Cascade admittedly wasn't that impressive, it really looked cinematic. And Game Over managed to strike a nice balance between cinematic shots and frenetic action. Sure, making the animation a bit more advanced might result in them having to make Collide shorter, but I'd honestly be fine with that because this flash really starts to drag in the second half. As things stand, we've got characters in the goofy joke art style fighting the bad guys with powers that have barely been talked about since Act 5. How are the fights themselves though? There's too many fights for me to talk about each one individually, so I'm just gonna talk about the four big ones. The fight with the Condes probably has the most screen time of the bunch, as she's essentially the main villain now because of poor plot structure, but I digress. Her fight is the embodiment of every problem I just listed, but there are some good elements. The powers the kids use against her are creative and visually pleasing, and all the more detailed shots with her look great. Jake and Arqueus' fight against the Felt is actually the best part of this flash. The base sprites work well for this fight, both because of the chaotic nature of the Felt's powers and the fact that this is the comic relief battle. Plus, it's pretty awesome seeing Dad Egbert kicking ass, even though it is kind of weird that Droog doesn't show up here. He had all this build up and they just do nothing with him. Even Casey got a moment to shine, but Droog didn't? Dave, Dirk, and Terezi versus the Jax is easily the weakest fight of the bunch. It has the same problems as the HIC battle, but the visuals aren't as cool here, and there are some logical issues. For starters, Lord Jack has English's laser breath and hits the kids with it and they don't die? That thing is strong enough to kill ghosts, but it only does normal damage to Dave? I know there's a few explanations that could make sense, but it still feels wrong. Also, just a quick side note, Lord Jack is such a pointless character. He's just a plot convenience, a way for Caliborn to show his power, a reason for Jade to leave the ship early, and a way for the kids to kind of fight Lord English, but not really. The worst part of this fight, though, is what they did to Spade Slick. He shows up to take down Lord Jack because he senses Lord English in him and wants revenge for his casino. Okay, that makes sense. But then he starts attacking Terezi and the Striders too. Why? They're on his side. Yeah, Jack is an incredibly violent guy, but he's capable of rational thought. Spade Slick specifically was shown to be willing to work with the trolls to further his agenda, but now he just starts killing because why not? Also, he gets killed off in the most unceremonious way possible. He gets decapitated by the same sword swing as Lord Jack, the main villain here, and Dirk, who was never going to stay dead. I don't care what fake out they did with Jane. I wasn't convinced for a second. Honestly, Spade should have just died in Cascade. It was the perfect send-off for him, and he had basically no business in the story afterward. Finally, we get the fight with Lord English himself. While not amazing, it is pretty good. His movements alone show you just how powerful he is. There are a few cool visuals with him, like the Undertale reference, and this one shot with Aradia that cracks me up for some reason. And that's about it as far as fights are concerned. Beck Noir loses his arm and is implied to hook up with Miss Paint. Everyone wins their respective 
fights, and we get a few really high quality images of the gang celebrating their victory. Oh, and the Flash ends with John looking like an anorexic Greg Heffley. Overall, I think Collide was alright. It had some good visuals and music, but the fights, while fun to watch, weren't as cinematic as they should have been, and while there was a ton going on, there wasn't a lot of variety or surprises. Just a bunch of fights that feel really samey. The fact of the matter is, alright isn't good enough for a moment like this. We needed something on par with Cascade, and it just didn't deliver. I know I've already implied this, but as stupid as it was, Game Over was a much better successor to Cascade. Yeah, it was the emptiest threat imaginable, but it was thrilling, action-packed, and tied a bunch of plot lines and character motivations together into one satisfyingly unsatisfying scene. Yeah, you know you screwed up with your big finale when I end the segment gushing about Game Over. So finally, after all the lingering in Act 6, and all those act, act, acts, we finally see the number 7. Just like with Collide, it's only a flash. The music here is good, and the animation is absolutely absolutely amazing. We're talking professional grade stuff right here. Unfortunately, what's being animated is only interesting about half the time. We get cool shots of things like Vriska's army marching toward Lord English and Caliborn destroying his clock, but we also get long, drawn-out sequences of the tadpole flying into Skya and a black hole forming. Also, most of the characters look really weird in this style. The only two that don't feel off are Caliborn and Vriska. Also, while we get a montage of the new world, including Cantown becoming a reality, I'm not really a fan of how the Flash ends by cutting to black. We don't even get to see how the weapon killed Lord English. Yay! The credits deliver a nice epilogue in a creative way, using Snapchat images the characters took of the new world. These pictures provide a nice, satisfying end for everyone. Well, except Terezi, who's still simping for Vriska, and John. Toward the end of the credits, it's clear he's going through some stuff, and it ends with Caliborn challenging him. And we all know how that turns out. Kind of a bummer note to end the comic on. Also, while I mostly haven't let the sequel material hurt my enjoyment of the original comic, Comic, this is the one exception. Words cannot describe how much this segment hurts after having read the epilogues, and it doesn't hurt in a good, dramatic way either. It's just straight up agony. So that's it. Aside from all the sequel and spin off material, which I might cover if this review does well, that's all of Homestuck. So to answer my question at the beginning of this long, long review, is Homestuck any good? Yes, it is. The first half is downright great. I know that Homestuck is usually seen as trash because of the fan base, but that first half is really good. The second half, though, really drops the ball. It had its moments, but most of it ranged from mediocre to terrible. So this brings up a very different, but still related question. Should you read Homestuck? Honestly, this conundrum makes me think of Game of Thrones. The show was widely beloved up until the last season or two sucked. After the show ended, I had a friend who mentioned he wanted to watch it. I brought up the widely hated ending, but he said he still wanted to see it, and that got me thinking. Are those first six seasons worthless now that the ending ruined things? Is it worth it for a newcomer to get invested even if they know it won't end well? I can't answer that question for Game of Thrones as I haven't actually watched it, but I do have a solution for Homestuck. Start at the beginning. Yes, the beginning. Don't listen to the troll obsessives. Like I said, make sure you enjoy the sense of humor, because you're gonna hate this comic if you don't. And most importantly, stop at Cascade. Not only is Cascade the perfect high note to go out on, but most of the plot lines get finished by then. Sure, it's not a perfectly conclusive ending, but neither are Collide in Act 7. And yes, you will be missing some good stuff in Act 6, especially Caliborn. But as amazing as Caliborn is, he's not worth trudging through all the other bullshit Act 6 throws at you. As for spin-off content, I'd recommend the Paradox Space comics and Hive Swap Friends Sim. Also, if you're apprehensive to read now that you know everything that happens, keep in mind this is an 8,000 page comic, about 4,000 of which I recommend reading. There are so many events and jokes I haven't talked about, so there are still plenty of surprises in store. I am Defawfalizer, and finally this review is done.